You are watching the Pan-African Daily TV with Dr. Susan Tata. The Africa we want. Unity. Consciousness. Our culture. Our spirituality. Our history. One Africa for Africans worldwide. Motherlands calling its diaspora home. Join my voice. Join my team. Join my campaign. Campaign 21 hashtag 1 million subscribers on the Pan African Daily TV YouTube. Be a volunteer. Apply now. Be the new Africa. After centuries of misguidance caused by slavery, colonization, lack of awareness of our history, and institutional disinformation, a new Africa is on the move, determined and getting organized. Africa to Kupamuja. Welcome to the United Kingdoms of Great Africa. The United Kingdoms of Great Africa is the cradle of the alliance movement of all African intelligences around a common ideal. The unity and development of a strong, concurring, and completely de-dogmatized Africa through the channel of a strong organization called The Africa We Want Global. You are an African, Afro-descendant, researcher, historian, scientist, or simply an NGO. You want to be part of this great historical march towards the total freedom of an uninhibited Africa? Visit our website, www.africawewantglobal.org. Register and discover the range of our platforms for change. Africawewantglobal.org. Join the kingdom, be part of it. An initiative of Dr. Susan Tata. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can see, I can see the chat is already full. Wow, you people are so, so amazing. You're so great. You're so great. Uh, uh, before we were even warming up, I could already see a lot of people. It seems as if Professor Yabari is having a huge, huge, I mean, touch on your souls. I can already see all of you were waiting. Matamera is saying, where are you? How are you doing, sister? We're waiting here. Yes. <laughs> Wow, but you can see King Africa is comfortably relaxed in his, you know, in his palace. Now you look at the, the Egyptian gods, you see your ancestors all surrounding his palace right there. So it means he's coming with a full package. So you guys get ready. I hope you have your water and you've been drinking and mining your African business. So <laughs> that's how we started, you know, and... Um, so we water our brains, we water our brains and be ready. You know, it's all about 1212 Ubuntu and um, getting to train our subconsciousness at 1212 PM when your alarm rings up, you just know, without me, know you, without you, know me. So that's mm. how we're going to retrain our programming. And I hope all of you have set out your alarms. I see people who actually, even when the alarms are ringing and they want to make sure that mine is ringing and they start calling, hey, Dr. Susan, my alarm is ringing at 12, 12 p.m. That's very good. And that's the point. Okay. And I hope um, uh, our friends, I mean, he looks so young. I mean, I don't even know how to dress <laughs> okay. No, because uh, it, as a matter of fact, the women out here have problems with a lot of them. When you guys come on, the first thing they want me to ask, are you married? Are you single? You have a family and, and, and this and this. You know, sisters, brothers, all of us want to keep these things really, really serious. We're saying it's all about us. In every aspect, it's all about us. Okay, so don't worry if you hear questions come out like that, my king. It is the family blood on the Pan-African Daily. The DNA is so hot. This one here, they are hard-headed, okay? So, but thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Today, we want to get to know you, and uh, we are very happy to have you in the, the roster or in the group or in the class of our World 
experts, uh, world famous experts that are Afrocentric, that are creating and changing, uh, changing the narratives that are teachers, uh, scholars, academics, uh, you know, bringing a handful of work of experience and research, you know, to join this list of prominence here on the Pan-African Daily. So we want to get to know you. Of course, we will be having impressions um, and, and feedback about the One Africa Conference because you hit it. You just had your anchor and you just went around like you were just touching every soul in that place. So and people were just like, who is he? Who is he? And I'm so happy and I'm giving a shout out to the Happy Movement and family and to Sister Queen, uh, Felicia and brother Taki who was here yesterday. It was a brilliant session and you you can see the lineup is so charged up because now we are activated we are connected we are one this is the africa that we're talking about so i just like to give you the audience so you would tell us everything about you and what is it that we expect to get from you because this is not the first time this is we just starting what is your focus what is your teachings what is your works where can we find you where can we follow you where, because when we find you we're never gonna let you go I mean, you're already in the passage now, all right? So we just want to know you, brother. We want to have a beautiful conversation with you. You know, it's today is the first time getting you into the family. You know, yeah. the audience is already hot. They want to know and, you know, everything about you. So over to you, my king. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, can I say, Dr. Tata, that I am so pleased to be here with the Pan-African Daily family and I, I'm really honored to be able to speak to an international African audience. Mm. And that's really the way that we should look at it. Africans around the world must unite. Yes. Africans around the world must move of one accord. And any small role that I can have in that movement is an honor for me. Mm -hmm. So as you said, my name is Jabari Osaze, and I am a historian an author and a comedic priest. I have spent uh, all of my adult life really studying the history of African people, particularly the ancient history of African people. Mm. I, like so many others, had heard at a very early age that Africans had done nothing worthwhile on the world stage, that in fact, Africans were nothing more than servants and slaves. Mm. And I knew that that could not be true. I, I knew that could not be true. So I spent really my adult life studying the history of people of African descent, focusing very commonly on the history of ancient Egypt that we should really be calling Kemet by its original name. Mm -hmm. I have um, taken over 3,000 people on trips to Kemet, on trips to the motherland, oh. divided between Ghana and, and mostly Kemet and Ethiopia. And I actually wrote a book known as Seven Little White Lies, A Conspiracy to Destroy the Black Self-Image. That's my book. Mm -hmm. and, and I really do believe that as a comedic priest, I also believe that our history will save us. We are the people that destroyed our chains. However, many of us are still struggling in the midst of Eurocentric spiritual forms as, as well. So all of those things, I think, are things that um, I have focused on for such a long period of time. And I'm really hoping that we can have a dialogue that is really, really global in order for us to move forward in power and peace. Fire. I already <laughs> see your, your <laughs> this is fire here. Um, a dialogue you see i like that word a dialogue you know why because like everything is out of the box it's uncovered yes. the lies the tricks the manipulation right. you know right. and so having a dialogue means now we just like laugh over things <laughs> like can you mm -hmm. imagine this was this can you imagine what this said can you imagine did you know or and they were like oh, okay now i know but i've mm -hmm. seen some people so curious here asking um Ozaze, and you know, I already asked it from which yes. country. I know there are Yoruba people here now that are just church up. You know, everybody wants to own his brother. Everybody wants to own if you're from Haiti and they see your name, Lala. Like, ah, it's us. And they're so proud of it. Can you just tell us, Yabari Ozaze? I already yes. asked. As, as I was saying to you, Dr. Tata, uh, I wasn't born Jabari Ozaze. I was born Corwin Jacobs. I, I was born with two Jewish names. And as I came into knowledge, of the history of people of African descent, 
I absolutely recognized that I could no longer use those names in, in, in confidence. And you could imagine my family, my nuclear family was dismayed that I was changing my name. I had originally first approached them and said, why don't we change our name together? They uh. didn't think I was serious until people started calling the house and saying, is Jabari home? That was when they said, what is happening? But uh, I really looked to um, have names that would connect me to my West African family, connect me to my origins. And so I chose Jabari Gamba Osaze. Um, and um, they're, they're names that come from different West African peoples. And so I'm, I'm excited to be able to say that um, I'm, I'm attempting to go back and fetch it. Um, most recently, I've also been an inst I'm now an installed chief in Ghana as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, my goal is to make sure that um, the African diaspora reconnects with continental Africans. That's really what my goal is because Dr. Tata, I'll, I'll say this and I'm sure we'll, we'll say more about it. While Africans often believe that we are in need of resources, in need of economic and political power, the reality is that all of the world's most precious resources are on the continent and diasporan Africans are situated in all of the political and economic centers of the world outside of Africa. If we work together in lockstep, we would see a radically different African reality within a decade. And then we would see that African people would once more utilize power for those things that we deserve and need. And so that is truly what I think we should be talking about. We should be reconnecting the African family, just like, and I'll, I'll take it to Kemet for a second, just like we know in the great spiritual myth, the body of Asar, some of you may know the name Osiris, the Greek version, the mm -hmm. body of Asar was torn into 14 pieces and it was a great journey to put that body back together again. In many ways, I think that that story is a wonderful allegory for what Africans must be about now. We must remember our ancestors in order to return to the throne. And that is in many ways, the story of Asar. Beautiful, beautiful. Brio Tim Paul. Yes, we have no business now on, on the planet just, than just uniting. That's mm -hmm. our only business. That's what we keep saying. Our only business is the business of unity. That's right. Uh, That's because right. now, and, and the world is waking up. That, that's one of the things that now the fight would be. You're going to see others that used to say, I'm not African, now becoming African to say, mm -hmm. but it's the cradle. You know, uh, my king, if, if now, I mean, our white brothers and everybody, you're going to talk about the civilization and it's the cradle of humanity. Now, don't you think they would start fighting back to say, hey, now we are also Africans? Yes. I see that happening. Yes, yes, yes. I remember the um, the lead singer of U2, Bono, uh, said, he got a little flack for it too, by the way. He said, we are all African. And so <laughs> he got a little flack for it from everybody because on one hand, Africans said, hey, wait a minute. You've excoriated us and oppressed us, not speaking to him in particular, but European and Western society. Now you're trying to say you're an African? How about we have some justice first and <laughs> then we'll, we'll settle the score. So that was certainly, he got flack from everyone, but we should know that uh, everyone in the world is a descendant of one African woman. That was part of the discussion that was a, a, a portion of my presentation at the One Africa Conference, which yes. took place in Detroit last weekend. My, my uh, presentation was in honor of the powerful ancestral scholar, Sheikh Anta Diop. So it was mm -hmm. called The African Origin of Civilization. And my approach was to look at that topic uh, in, in a really bifold manner, right? So on one hand, what I attempted to do, what I did, is I talked about how Africa peopled the world. That in fact, for a long period of time, the only human on the planet was the African. There was no other. And that when Africans then decided to leave the continent of Africa, as we got actually 
taken or, or as we travel to different locales, different environs, then we changed. Our phenotype, the way we looked, changed. And so, in fact, Africa peopled the world. And part of the presentation goes through uh, some of the attempts of Westerners, of Europeans, to try to misrepresent the African story. We'll talk about the word Caucasian in a moment. And then the second part of the presentation was really to talk about how Africans gave civilization to the world. So Africans didn't just give humanity to the world. I'm talking about literally the DNA that makes up us all. But Africans also gave civilization to the world. And in many ways, that's the topic that very few of us are familiar with, that Africans give literature, give science, give mathematics, give medicine give architecture, give spirituality, give engineering, give uh, virtually every major milestone of modern civilization was first given to the world by an African. And yet we still hear that Greece and Rome is the origin of civilization. And that narrative, not even the Greek and the Romans would have said that. <laughs> that this is <laughs> Pan-European, let's be very frank, white supremacist propaganda. The reality is it is the African that gave civilization to the world. And so that was the basis of my, of my presentation. And I truly think it's the kind of story that our children truly need to hear. I just yeah. gave a presentation for a school in Atlanta um, online just, just today and was really talking about how much particularly ancient Kemet in this presentation, gave to the world. And those children um, really were excited to hear exactly that narrative. I showed them the picture of the person that wrote the world's oldest book. <laughs> There's a picture of him, Dr. Tata. Yes. And, you know, the thing that's so funny, Dr. Tata, is when you go to any library on the planet, you will find at least six versions of the book. Mm -hmm. None of them have an image of him. But I know, and I've had the honor of taking people to Kemet, to a museum that almost no one goes to, mm -hmm. so that they can see the full life-size, full-color statue of this man. And so I'd love. I'm, I'm hopefully going to show it to the Pan African Daily TV family um, today as well. So I, I really want us to recognize that um, once we understand exactly what it is that Africans gave to the world, we will once again understand exactly what we're capable of. In fact, all of those things that challenge the African, all those things that the African is concerned about all of those problems, all of those hurdles, all of those potholes in the road are, are things that Africans can surmount. But it, it, in order for us to understand that, we have to see what we've done. And so that is why this story of how Africans gave civilization to the world is so important. Um. Yes, because the, the damage, the mixture, the confusion yeah. has been so yeah. much, okay, the mixture. And I, and I really can understand when I see people in the chat saying it is not possible that we can unite. It is not, uh, uh, we cannot be talking about the unity of Africa in doing European politics and stuff like that. I think, you know, this, uh, this is a fact. I, I don't want to deny that so soon because most of us are still on the journey of awakening. But the stage at yeah. which you are and at which I, are, I am, we just know that this is our time and it, we are just unstoppable. And mm. the biggest uh, um, advantage that we have is we can speak all the languages. And we yeah. were thinking it was a disadvantage. Now we know the techniques, we know everything. So whether it's European politics, we can do it. Whether it's African politics, we can do it. Whether it's world politics, we can do it. So That's what right. is it again? Now we just begin to choose which one are we doing, but we prefer to go back to Kemet. So go mm. over, my, 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 my prince. Tell us what is Kemet, if people want to hear. And they're just like, what is Kemet? A lot of people are saying this is the Israelites, you know, uh, that are there, the monks or whoever. What is Kemet? Kemet is that land that actually was um, peopled by 
individuals, by Africans that were further into the interior of the continent of Africa. And civilization, people in many ways, traveled up from its origins in what we could consider sort of South Central or Southeast Central Africa. It traveled up the river with civilizations, important civilizations being deposited all along the way. When we actually arrived in Northeast Africa, that is when our great civilization really flowered. That's not to say that Kemet, that place that so many people call Egypt, Egypt is a Greek word. Egypt is a Greek word. Um, that, that place that we call Kemet was the flowering of civilization while it was not the first civilization, but we actually see that it is the civilization that gives so much to the world. Mm -hmm. That's where we see the first, the oldest, the, the oldest complete book coming forward. That's where we see it. That's where we see mathematics come forward and we see the first mathematic text come forward. It's not where we see the first mathematic artifact. There are two artifacts from Central, South Central Africa that are so old, Dr. Tata, that we really don't have a reference for how old they are. The <laughs> world's first mathematic artifacts, two of them. One is about 40,000 years old. One is about 20,000 years old. Hmm. That is how old we're talking about. So it, it, we should be absolutely clear that the African is the one that created modern civilization. And in many ways, what we have seen is that we are living through a period of identity theft. Now, I know that people think that when someone steals their credit card or their social security number, that that is identity theft. But in actuality, when we look at the greatest and most egregious form of identity theft, it is when the entire identity the entire, all of the accomplishments of an entire group of people have been stolen. Yes. That is what we are living through. And I know, Dr. Tata, I'm in an unusual place because what I end up doing is arguing with us about us. Yes. <laughs> because we are actually at a place where we're just beginning to awaken. But clearly we should say, and I know that folks recognize that Africans in the world are still struggling considerably, right? But, mm -hmm. I, and I don't want us to just focus on those struggles. There's a lot of work to be done. I want us to look at where we were 100 years ago and then look at where we are now. The African is ascendant. Did you hear what I said? The African is ascendant. This is the time. This is the time. So while we continue to see that Africans are struggling, we have to recognize that we have won many battles. Yes. We have won many battles and we will win many more. We will be part of this resurrection and some of the work will be done by this queen that you are seeing on your screen right now. I mean, for her to say that she's going to have a, a global show where we can talk as Africans on the continent and Africans throughout the diaspora, th this is not just a, a, a minor event that you are partaking in, folks in the chat. This is going to be a key element of our liberation. Because when we reunite the African family, like the pieces of Asar, we will return to the throne. Ashe. Hmm. Payete. Mm. Payete, my mm. king. Mm. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> we, we, we are only, um, what we're doing now is just assuming because it, it's a fact. It's a fact. You can, I don't know, sometimes, you know, because we are already on it. So it, 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 you see those that are still asleep, they, don't, they, they, they still don't get there. But right. folk, like you say, my people, it is just that time. I get the the I get even my German uh, Caucasians families now looking and begging and asking for contacts. They want to retire home on the continent. Please, do yes. you get what I'm saying? Do you I understand do. what I'm saying? So, I do. So, I do. So when, when we are here talking about it is time, otherwise 
it's going to be late that you will leave. They will leave you here and they will follow them again. Because <laughs> that's what should not happen. Or our children would then follow again, go and walk on the continent under them. Can you imagine how crazy this would be? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Listen, the, the African continent is still a contested space. I mean, we just have to recognize that as I travel on the continent. Uh, there are times that I see nothing more than large 18 wheelers emblazoned with Chinese writing, for example. I, mm. I, I um, ask your audience to get a book by Howard W. French called China's Second Continent. Mm -hmm. China's Second Continent that puts um, China's role in Africa in proper perspective. Now, let's be clear. China is not coming with guns and whips and, and dynamite as the European powers did. But that still doesn't mean that we shouldn't be concerned about the control of, of mineral wealth, resources, and land, right? We still have to defend those things that are in the purview of Africans. Um, and so that's part of the story. And then, of course, Dr. Tata, as you say that there are Europeans that are looking to return, this is a reality. This is a reality that this is a contested territory. Just, uh, I, I wanna say it's about two weeks ago, the New York Times had a series of stories on how so many of the resources that are necessary for modern computers, for cell phones, and even for solar power, by the way, which is the future. So many of the minerals that are necessary to drive these critical technologies are found in the Congo. Mm -hmm. Yes, that same place that uh, met with a uh, uh, terror and dread at the hands of Europeans for things like rubber. Now we are seeing that the Congo is the source of the of the site where so many of the critical resources are are present. And um, I, I, there's a wonderful for those of you who are not subscribed to the New York Times. Because I'm talking about I'm a New Yorker and in the United States. Go to your podcast and and um, they have a free podcast every day called The Daily the daily and look at the piece on resources in the Congo. It is a fascinating, maybe 30 to 40 minute conversation on how everyone, there is a new scramble for Africa. And I'm saying to you that continental Africans, there's nothing wrong with investment as long as Africans are in control. Let me say that. As long as Africans are control in control, you can invest. But the problem that we have is that investment has never, at least not for the last few hundred years, has not been on Africa's terms. It has not truly benefited Africa's at, Africans at home and abroad. And so we have a lot of work to do. And as I speak to diasporan Africans, Dr. Tata, I'm always saying to them, we need to become in, involved in the activities of our, um, our cities, in, in, the, in the diaspora and also on the continent. My wife and I are building a house in Ghana. We will be part of Ghana. Now we're not planning on relocating, relocating entirely to Ghana, but I wouldn't mind being in Ghana about half the year and abroad elsewhere about half the year. Because I don't think that Africa necessarily needs all of the diaspora and Africans outside of the continent to return. What Africa needs, what the continent needs is for diaspora and Africans to be activated in New York, in London, in, 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 um, in Tokyo. We need Africans to be activated and working in lockstep towards African aims. And when we do that, we're going to see something curious occur. We're going to begin to see that Western powers and others, I'm talking about you, China, Western powers and others will have to march to an African drumbeat once more. And so that is what we need to do. Um, and, and I truly believe that that is, that's a story that I get. Now I know I'm talking in some ways about global politics and global economics, right? That's the story that I've come to by studying our history about how Africans gave these technologies to the world. Mm. Um, here's just one story, Dr. Tata, one story. And I'm not gonna even go to Kemet for this. I'm not gonna go to Kemet for this. This is part of the story that I shared on Saturday. We are in the midst of a global pandemic, right? Mm. And there's so many people who are talking about vaccine technology. 
Now I'm going to say this, regardless of how you feel about the vaccines that are out there, I hear many of us giving the European credit for that technology. Well, when you look at the most powerful nation in the world, the United States, we have to recognize that vaccine technology was not developed here. It was brought to the United States by an enslaved African from Ghana. A man, a, a, a European in Boston enslaved a man. And it, this was during the, the small pox, pox epidemic where tens of thousands of Europeans were dying. And so they didn't want to deal with the bodies of their relatives who were sick and dying, Dr. Tata. They said, that's what the enslaved Africans are for. Let them deal with the sick so that we can stay healthy. And they found something curious happened. Those enslaved Africans were not getting sick, at least not anywhere near the rate that the Europeans were. And so this European, a man by the name of Cotton Mather, reverend, and I'm not saying he's reverend, I'm saying that was his title. Certainly if you're enslaving Africans, how can you be a reverend? But he, this man named Reverend Cotton Mather speaks to one of the Africans who he's in, he is enslaving. And he says, why aren't you getting sick? And this enslaved African, who was then known in history as Onesimus, mm -hmm. Onesimus says, well, we have a procedure in West Africa and that's why we don't get sick. We take some of the material of the pustules from inside the smallpox pustule, we dry it in the sun, and then we scrape the skin of someone who has not been sick with that, um, that material. Hmm. And those individuals are not contracted. Well, Cotton Mather, Cotton Mather writes a major scholarly work on what he hears from Onesimus. And at first he's, he's derided, how this, these enslaved Africans don't know anything about science. And slowly it is utilized. And within just a few short years, tens of thousands of Europeans are saved in effect by Onesimus, Dr. Tata. And you would say, well, Cotton Mather's a reverend. At the very least, he would have said, you know what, this enslaved African saved tens of thousands of people, and he allowed me to move further into prominence because he described this mechanism. I'm the one that brought it to my peers, and now we're saving people. Maybe I should free him. He did not free him. Onesimus had to work on the side when he was not demanded to work for free under the pain of the whip and the lash by Cotton Mather to save his money to buy his freedom. Onesimus does buy his freedom. And I just want to say to you, that is how much Africans have given to the world. So as we sit here in a pandemic with people talking about vaccine technology, Regardless of how you feel about the ones that are out there, I want you to recognize that technology came from West Africa. That technology is in the purview of you, African. What have you not given the world? We have to give those Europeans that are in control of the world much less credit and understand the history of the African once more. When we understand our history, we're going to go in a radically different direction. And I wanna say something else to you, Dr. Tata. Mm -hmm. I just recently, some of you know that perhaps the most prestigious um, university in the United States, the one that everyone mentions is Harvard University, right? Mm -hmm. Well, last week, actually it might be about a week and a half ago, Harvard University, said that they were going to dedicate a hundred million dollars to try to make amends for what they are now admitting was the university's seminal role in enslavement. Now listen, a hundred million dollars sounds like a lot of money, but not when you Can have- you say it again? Can you just repeat that again, please. <laughs> Harvard University mm -hmm. said that they are now committing a hundred million dollars to make amends for what they were part of, which was enslavement. They had enslaved people taking care of, uh, of professors, feeding students. The, we have the names now of about 70 enslaved Africans 
who were enslaved essentially by Harvard. There are names of buildings, prominent names of buildings that, um, that commemorate enslavers. So now Harvard is trying to say, we're sorry. Now keep in mind, Harvard has an $8 billion endowment and they are now dedicating $100 million. To me, that's a pittance. But you might say, well, how do these stories connect, Brother Jabari? How did you jump from Onesimus and smallpox to Harvard University. Guess, you remember I told you about that enslaver that enslaved Onesimus, a man named Cotton Mather? His mm -hmm. father was the president of Harvard. What? Been exactly sure that enslaved people would play a very heavy role at Harvard University. His father's name was Increase Mathers. Increase Mathers. We have to connect the dots. Follow the breadcrumbs. In many ways, this is almost like re reassembling a crime scene. You know how you see those photos? You have all these photos everywhere and little notes and, and, and detectives have strings in between them, Dr. Tata. That's what we're doing because our enslavement was seminal to the development of the Western world. Just as the knowledge of ancient Africans was seminal to the development of the early world. The entire story of the world is about what Africans have done and what Africans have had done to them. This story is critical. And I'm hoping that all of the people of African descent who are hearing my voice and seeing my image will be recommitted to reconnecting and to understanding what we've done. We've been told a lot of things about ourselves. We've been told so many things about ourselves that we can now prove are untrue. That we can recognize the resiliency of Africans. We can recognize the ingenuity of Africans. We can recognize the rebelliousness of Africans. And we now must recognize the glorious future that is ahead of Africans. If we do the work that our ancestors expect us to do, we must complete their works. And so this is of critical importance. <laughs> I've given you a lot to think about. <laughs> it's not just what to think about, but you know why I'm laughing. And, and most of the time now I just laugh. I just smile because like, you know, we are past, we are past that level to sit and and even the times of lamentations and, and, the, and yes. the morning and the weeping. I keep saying here on the Pan-African Daily, we did it, you know, when we started all these times. We cried a couple of times. We, we talked. We, we commented. We, you know, we accused each other. Now we are yes. above yes. that. And I keep saying this is beautiful May. Beautiful May means it's just inject, uh, particularly after the Happy Movement One Africa Conference. Exactly this, this, this spirit that you're watching here. Is exactly what we get from that, and when we yeah. get this, we explode. We're no longer in that in that space where we sit and begin to the oh, you know, but the problem is still our leaders. Oh, you know, it's because um, we don't love ourselves. Oh, you know, those are still the fabrication, the plastication. I call it plastic narratives, right? And mm -hmm. but now at this point, anyone that is listening to you, if they just look at you, my king. I mean, like one Africa would go to dig and research. Why some of us are just busy enjoying, you know, uh, going to a work, partying. Someone is that digging to know these lies and bring these facts to you. That is enough evidence that it's our time. Mm. When I look at the scholars, the teachers, the researchers. I mean, they are woke, particularly at this One Africa conference and all of them that we've been having. How much more can we just say? You know, because this is all knowledge that was hidden. Yes. Was, was just on the cover and we were just rumbling around reading books that bring us nothing. But this fact right. is right here. How much yeah. more can we say this is our time? Continue, my king. Tell us. Yeah, yes. I have to say that um, we can't expect those people who benefit from our subjugation to tell us the narrative that will free us from that subjugation. We can't, mm -hmm. we can't expect that. And so these are stories that while, uh, you know, I always say something else, Dr. Tata. I say blame is different than responsibility, mm. right? So we might blame those Western systems for putting us in the situation that we are in, but that does not 
that does not say that they are responsible for undoing it. It is we will have to be responsible for our uplift. Correct. And so it's going to be of critical importance for us to scour every page of history, to look in every old tomb, to read every old text, to look for our image. And as we do that, we will once again reconnect with a line that certain people on the planet sought to break. When they took diasporan Africans out of the door of no return, just think about what that was called. We are breaking your lineage. When they came into societies and carved them up according to their own aims on the continent during what some would call the scramble for Africa, they thought that they had actually sounded the death knell of African power. Well, I'm here to say to you, family, that Africans are resilient, Africans are rebellious, and that we are rising again. I, I just want to show you. Can I show you the picture of the African that Go wrote ahead. the world? This book, oh Dr. yes. I I want you to take a look at this because one of the things I want to be able to do is give some folks some concrete information that they'll be able to understand. Take a look mm -hmm. at this person, by the way. Now, okay. if you go to any library, virtually in the world, you will find this person's book. It is called the Maxims of Patahotep, the maxims of Patahotep. But what you That's won't find, as I was saying to you earlier, is you won't find his picture. It's not in any of the books. Mm -hmm. Now, I would actually have to feel that perhaps that's by design. Because the book is so old, some of us might just assume that there are no images. But I'm saying to you that I have had the honor of taking over 3,000 people into a museum that is known as the Imhotep Museum. Mm -hmm. We could talk about Imhotep. It, mm -hmm. Into a museum known as the Imhotep Museum. And there you will find this full-size, full-color image of this great African. He writes what is known today as the maxims of Patahotep. So what am I really saying? I'm saying that as we look at all of the things we, we've done and we look at all the things that have been done to us, what we have done far outshines what has been done to us. And that is why we need to reconnect to that narrative as well. Mm. This is so true. Yeah, this is of critical importance. And, and I'll say to you that picture, Dr. Tata, I took with my own camera. <laughs> because, that? because, because that's what I'm just thinking. I was, yeah. actually, I was like, is did, did you do it by yourself? Because I the way took it with my own camera. Yep, 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 yep. And I'm going to say to you, um, at the time I took it. Now I'm going to squeal on myself a little bit, Dr. Tata. I took it at a time when they said there were no pictures allowed. Okay. And when I realized that I was going to see what was there, I didn't even know it was there when I first went. But when I saw it, I said they're going to have to, I'm going to have to get a fine or they're going to have to, because this has to get out. Um, I was familiar with the Maxis of Patahotep because I've studied ancient Kemet, but I was not aware that this statue was found in his tomb. We mm -hmm. now know what Africans gave to literature. We have been told that we are people that are, that are um, illiterate, Dr. Tata. Yes. Yet we gave literacy to the world. That's really what I'm saying to you. As I said, that we are in the midst of the greatest and most egregious moment of, um, uh, of identity theft. We have to get to the place once more where we're undoing what has been done to us. Ooh. I mean, um, this is so amazing. Like <laughs> when you talk about the museums, are you a curator mm -hmm. in, in, Tell us more. I mean, we just get so curious. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I honestly believe also that while I have a very, I, I often have a very mixed, um, uh, uh, I've mixed emotion about museums because often there are artifacts in museums that were taken from the continent, taken from other places in the world. And those people who um, created those amazing things um, are not often even asked whether that should happen. They were taken during 
times when other people were in control of the world. So I recognize that, right? On the same token family, you should get to the museums around you because you need to see those artifacts so that we can actually tell the story once more. So the museum that that particular artifact is in is called the Imhotep Museum. It's just a, a few um, yards, I would say, from what is generally called the Step Pyramid. Um, uh, the, the true name of the Step Pyramid is Kebu Neteru. Kebu Neteru. So it's only a few yards from Kebu Neteru. And I'm gonna tell you, Dr. Tata, that the thing that I find so amazing is that it's at a museum that no one goes to. Now, listen, it's in the middle of the desert in the, the, um, the nation that is now known as Egypt, the nation that should be known by its original name, Kemet, right? Mm -hmm. It could easily be 115, 120 degrees there, easily. When I take my group there, and I've gone very often with an organization called the African Genesis Institute, which was founded in Philadelphia. When we go there, you know what actually happens? They turn on the AC. Okay. And you would say, wait a minute, it's 115 degrees. Why is the AC not running? Well, they've, or, they've thought, why should we run the AC? Nobody's coming here. They put it on when we get there. I have been there over 20 times. And in all of the times I've been there, I have only seen less than five other people there other than the group that I take. And so I'm saying it's it, we're going to have to scour the halls of history in order to understand what we did. This is of, of critical importance. Yeah. So, so we, should all be, we should all be going, I mean, yes. that's also one thing that we did. Now you see the, there's a new, um, I don't really know. There's, a, <laughs> there's another new wave of African now, living the diaspora, not going to the continent to find out about their history or to study who they are, but they're yes. now going to Dubai, right? You know, it's, yes. just, like, it's just another new wave, like now yes. Dubai is going to recolonize you know, and this time they pay their tickets to go write comments, make pictures, and just like, and this museum is here. We don't know about it. Dr. Tata, I mean, they have malls and, and high-end shops in the places where they already are. Why would you travel across the world to go yes. to a high-end shop when you can actually take your car <laughs> or drive, get on the bus or the train wherever you are to go to that same shop? I, you know, the, it's the same thing that I remember when I was a younger man. Some of my colleagues would say that they, I had gone to, I went to vacation on the Champs Elysees. I've, I've been to Venice, and and I would honestly say to them so often, it's interesting that you go to all of these European places, but you've never been to the continent. I still say that to people. You've never been to the continent. You want to travel everywhere else in the world. Uh, we, now, listen, I'm not saying that you shouldn't go to other places in the world. I'm saying, why is it that you have made it your, um, your aim to stay away from the place where you have your origin? That's, that's really what's happened. And, you know, and then we wonder, then we wonder aloud why the continent is still struggling to find its footing. Well, part of it is because um, it's sons and daughters that are outside the continent have not sought to become reinvolved in the affairs of the continent. And that's part of the challenge. You know, one of the reasons why um, Nelson Mandela was, was released from prison eventually is because diasporan Africans deemed it so. Diasporan Africans, I remember I was in college at the time, in high school and college. I was really involved in the divest, divestment movement. I attended Cornell University. I was the chair of the ad hoc committee on South Africa. And we gave, we forced Cornell to divest its funds. We did the sorts of creative things we did. Um, I, we, I remember a major protest we did on parents weekend. So when the parents come to see their children at the university, they're paying in some instances, hundreds of thousands of dollars for them, them to attend. We would actually kind of wander in. Somebody would already be there earlier in a space in a library. So I'd be eating food. And then 
with a whistle, we would all get together and unveil this large banner telling the university to divest. We did a lot of things to try to argue that the university should pull its money out of South Africa. We made what they were doing untenable financially. Diasporan Africans did played a large role in that. Mm -hmm. And we have to be involved in the affairs on the continent again. We have to reconnect with our brothers and sisters on the continent. Oh, yes. We must. We must. It's one of the ways that we will all, we're going to make sure, I live in Harlem. That's one of the ways that we're going to make sure Harlem is a prosperous community. And that's the way we're going to make sure Accra, Lagos, and all of the other places on the continent are prosperous again. We have to work together once more. One African conference, mm. um, Detroit. I know a lot of people, I can already see. Uh, Kwame is like, we we must get together everywhere, not just in Detroit, yes. like we did. Um, you were at that conference and you you yes. saw. I mean, now we, we're just saying it's the start. Of course, we're not saying that it, it, it's it's going to be the sing song or that that or, or whatever. Yes, of course we do congratulate uh, uh, our brothers and sisters out there who pull out, you know, and support it. And we saw a lot of them put their services out there to make sure that it worked. But that was the like what um, Ron, uh, Elder Ron Spears is saying. It was an awakening. Mm -hmm. And so something must start from somewhere. There must be a spark, and then from that spark we begin to multiply it to other places, isn't it? Now, just give yes. us your impression. Yeah, How did, you know, give us a feedback. I, I think that the, 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 conference, the conference, Dr. Tata, was powerful. I didn't get much sleep, but I'm still feeling lifted by it. You hear what I'm saying? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you know, Friday night I got there and I got a chance to just talk with some of the elder scholars. I mean, we were up really, really late just talking, just talking. And then when things kicked off in full stream on Saturday, we had amazing presentations. The elder comedic priest, um, 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 uh, Infundishi, did an amazing job to start us off. You should have seen, if you haven't seen, you should have seen our brother, Dr. Ken, who was the MC, I was so impressed with him. He was an we, amazing MC. We heard from incredible scholars. We heard from people who have been thinking about Africa and the African diaspora for a long time. And I'm going to say to you that this conference, which was originally planned for Aswan, Egypt, was more powerful in Detroit. It was more powerful in Detroit. And you should have seen the number of people in the room, standing yes. room only. Oh, yes. So many people tuning in online. This was a really powerful event. I spoke to literally dozens upon dozens of people from all over the United States and some who had flown in from other countries for this event. And so it was such an amazing experience. Dr. Tata, that you were part of as well. So <laughs> we are all happy. We, we need to do more like this, right? As a matter of fact, that should be our only business. Yeah. Every weekend. Every weekend, there has to be a one Africa conference. I mean, after, after all is said and done, probably I'm only waiting for for the Caribbean from the 19th to the 27th. And when I come back, I have to go from one city to the other, one country. I don't even know what mm. we have anything again to do. Like we say, we should just be moving like the people that we are, the, the, the hurt, the, 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 the uh, you know, we move from one to the other. That's right. That's right. Contaminating one another. I don't see anything like we have to wait a year or we have to wait some months again. This conference this one africa conference should be petitioned whether people in the neighborhood just sitting together talking only about that and that's mm. why i love the happy movement and i'm still shouting out to them no matter how we say because she's like yes um we're going to fix it and put it there for people to just download and share or people to you know to use it so now we yeah. have a blueprint we have a blueprint where Every conference, diaspora, don't wait for somebody. 
Just organize right. yourself in your communities, in your groups. Professor James Moore said it one million times here. Yes. Group yourself in your neighborhoods, in your communities, in your centers, in your villages, and just upload and download all this stuff. What was Brother Ozaze talking about? It's the same thing I'm producing. I produce more than 1,000 conversations with the world's greatest. It's there for free. We're not selling anything. We're not asking anybody, okay, pay us before you download. It is right. there for us. This is Africa. Do right. your seminars, whether in the church, whether we're downloaded and just listen. It's our That's time. Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. It has to, uh, we have to make sure that the conference is not just something that occurred at a time, right? No. So that folks are able to access the amazing presentations that occurred. And I know that I saw some really, now listen, if you tuned into the live stream, you saw that it was done extremely professionally. When I, I tuned into the live stream while I was there and I was like, that must be a 4K camera. That's amazing. So <laughs> it, was, it was professionally done, right? So we should expect that what we're going to do is we're going to be able to have a really good series of videos that you can um, receive that you can tune into that will describe the conference. And, and just as Dr. Tata is saying, we do not have to wait. We do not have to wait to replicate this kind of energy. There's no reason to. We can go to the other parts of the black world and have these sorts of conferences, whether we're talking about New York, whether mm -hmm. we're talking about Lagos, yes. whether we're talking about Nairobi, whether we're talking about London, where we are are places that these sorts of conferences should occur. And we should be about the business of finding each other in the same room, whether it's in a chat room online or it's in a room in some sort of venue again. So we can begin to strategize, right? This is this is really powerful. And one of the other things that happens, Dr. Tata, is when you go to a place like Detroit, mm -hmm. you get to speak to the folks that are in Detroit about what they're doing and about where they go and about what events they have. And as a New Yorker, I know that I'm like, wow, I need to go to that event. I need to connect with people in that event. I've spoken to so many different folks from Detroit um, since I've come back and it's only Wednesday because we've made connections. We're going to do things together. That is what needs to happen. When I travel in the world, I always take people with me, right? They're, they're people who are part of my experience that live in those places. Just today, I was on the phone with someone in London, someone in Detroit that I just met, and someone in um, Cape Coast, Ghana. I mean, the, we have to get to the point where our Rolodex, I know I'm using the old world because I'm getting old, Dr. Tata. Our Rolodex <laughs> is, is, is filled with African thinkers and African activists around the world so that we can plan together and partake together in our um, ascendance. That's really what we need to do. Yeah, and, and that's why I don't I don't see any reason why we even always uh, uh, think. You just said something like, and I begin to see every time when we gather and we bring our minds together, we expand. So like, and and Professor James said it last time. He's like, no, I'm not going to give up my North Carolina. It belongs yeah. to me. Yet, that's but right. I have my continent. So it's like we getting the hooked. You know, we we are not saying diaspora leave and go back no you belt it we own it and at the, at the end of the day we just own the world we own it that's right so, so whether we're determining how it should happen in new york we're determined how it should happen in accra or it that's should right. happen in Yaounde or in limbe or in bamenda this, this, yes this, this the whole so why are we limited it's not a matter of like it's just a geographical space or that we live, we are not limited. Mm. Go to China. We have black Chinese. We speak that That's shit right. out there, whether it's Mandarin or whatever. And now sometimes we keep always like, oh no, you know, now they bring their language. Come on, guys, we own the world. Yes. Whether you, where, everywhere. We speak Portuguese, we speak German, we That's speak right. French, we speak English, we speak everything. That's right. That's right. And, and the continent does not need... Now, I know that there was a point where we said we were going to all go back to Africa. 
I think that we will go back to Africa. That just doesn't mean that we have to live there 365 days of the year. We have to get to the point where we recognize that there are these things that we see above us sometimes called planes. We don't <laughs> need to be there all of the time. We can actually be in the places where we have uh, set some roots down and still be connected to our family worldwide. That's going to be the, 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 the model for power. When you come to New York, when you come to when you go to LA, when you go to Philadelphia, what will you see in those cities? Sometimes you'll see a Chinatown. <laughs> Do you think that the people that are there in that Chinatown don't still have connections to China? Of course they still have connections to China. Of course they do. But now they're living someplace else. There's nothing wrong with that. We're going to be able to use those things that were done to us to undo those things that were done to us. I'm in New York because of what happened to my family. That's why I'm here. Because I was torn. My family was torn from the continent. And I'm going to go back and forth through that door of no return because I have returned. And there's gonna be a house where I could lay my head on my own pillow in Ghana. However, I'm not planning on leaving Harlem permanently. I'm gonna go back and forth and we're gonna make sure that when that we actually are able to control what the West does on the continent by being a thorn in their side where their capitals are. Do, do, does that make sense? We're gonna make sure that they can't just do things over there because the people that are over there that they would like to dismiss are over here too. That's how we should look at this. That's how we should look at this. We are global. This is 2022. The world is global. The world is, I'm talking to, to the Queen Tata from Germany. The world is global. We don't need to necessarily all be in the same place anymore. I think that we should still journey to the continent regularly because that is the motherland, but that doesn't mean that we have to live there permanently. We have to do more. We have to do more. We have to do more. And, and, yeah. and I just think because when we when we talk all the time that we are spiritual, mm -hmm. spiritual beings don't even sit in one place. Mm -hmm. We're everywhere. Our spirit is everywhere. So yes. imagine if, 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 if our spirits could travel, build the world civilization. And so even right from here, we're building Africa. And, yes. I, I, and, and even some of the people that are still worried, like, oh, you see, uh, the Chinese or this, they're going and taking it. And I still say no. <laughs> and I still, every time, I still find a reason to say, you know what, even if they go and we only sit here and just drum and dance, they will follow us back here. <laughs> 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 I'm so sorry. Africa, African culture is that endearing. You're right. They're going to come back, right? So we we just have to make sure that they don't have control of all of the mineral wealth of the continent. That's what we have to do. And, there's, and, and I'm going to say it again. There's nothing wrong with investment, but we must be in control. It's that simple. We must be in control. It should be on our terms. That's what has to happen. If we're looking at even the demographics, Let's just even talk about the growth in the demographics. I mean, mm -hmm. this is something that we keep ignoring, but but that they do understand when they say, you know, um, 60 percent or 45 percent is under the age of of 18 and 22 or something like that. You know, because we're not really we, we just see ourselves. We're many. <laughs> I mean, when we want yes. everyone to see we're many. So figures and stats it doesn't really play a big role. But. It is really essential for us to understand, you know, when they say, and I think it, it, it's apart from us that don't know that we are the future, not mm. the future, the present, apart from mm. us Africans that don't know. The Caucasians know that long ago. They know it. If you look at the Harvard studies um, uh, or the Boston consulting studies that we done, uh, was done 2010, they'd already, um, and I could see that time, the minister of the then, um, um, I think economic or something uh, and development in Germany was just going, con you know, city to city. And they created now this Africa Competence Center. 
And the whole mm -hmm. thing was about that Boston consultant, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, index that they put out there, you know, showing the pronostics of how Africa is going to overtake. Yes. You know, you know, because of this money, they just pick the, the knowledge and start going, you know, and trying to start educating. And at that time, even their curriculums are changing. Now we have African mm -hmm. studies. And now, do you think when they bring the curriculum and they're teaching about Africa to their children or to non-Africans, what is it that they're doing? Mm, mm. They are preparing to have access to the continent, to Thank its you. mineral wealth, to the wealth <laughs> of its people, to its climate wealth. Listen, I live in New York. I'm telling you that half the year, I'm like, can I go to Ghana, please? Half the year, I'm like, why do I have to shovel? You know what I mean? So, so, so many people are thinking that being on the continent is a wonderful thing. And so, yeah, they're preparing their families to be able to do that, right? And I think that we have to get to the point where um, we're preparing our people too, that we know that we have to actually get to the continent, do what we're doing on the continent, and then bring resources back from the United States, from the UK, from Asia, from Europe, back to the continent, and bring resources for the continent back to our communities, those Black communities that are struggling in the diaspora. I, I often say to people, people say to me, Dr. Tata, why should I go to Africa? They're not helping me. And I have to say to them, first of all, you have to understand that a, a really wicked game was played on both of us, right? You have to understand that. It's not like you, you were taken from the continent of Africa and Africa was left to improve and develop on its own. Africa, the continent, most countries, the overall minority number of countries, dealt with the scourge of colonialism and also the scourge of underpopulation when some of its youngest and most productive members of those societies were stolen away. So the continent has struggled. All we have to do is look for that incredible book by, by Walter Rodney, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. That's what we um, need to, 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 to use as one of our references again. And so as we look at that, I think we have to recognize, and I say this to people very often, I'm not talking about a charity model. I'm saying that Africans in the diaspora have to work with Africans on the continent. You know, there were years when I used to travel to the continent, Dr. Tata, that <laughs> people and others would say, can you give me some money? Right, they see an African American and they assume I live in the in the wealthiest nation in the world that I can help. Do you know a few years ago people on the continent stopped asking me for money? You know what they started asking me for? They'd run up to me and say, "Do you have WhatsApp?" That's what they would say. Do you have WhatsApp? Why? <laughs> because they want to connect. I remember the first time I heard that, I said, what is happening? <laughs> because people aren't asking for anything. They're saying, let's work together. That is what needs to happen. And the first time that a young person asked me, do I have WhatsApp? I, we connected. And I remember about two weeks after I'd been back in the United States, that young person, he was 13. He said, here are the baskets that my mother makes. Is there a way that you can get them to get sold where you are? This 13-year-old Ghanaian child was uh, was thinking about global, global import and export. We are <laughs> not talking about a charity model. And if that's what some of you in the diaspora are hearing, get up off it. We're talking about working together so we can prosper together. That's what we're talking about. And so I think that that's what we need to recognize. Everyone else is there. If you don't, now if people that are listening to me don't go and download that episode of The Daily that deals with the resources in the con in the um, Congo, I think it might be called the world's most important metal or something to that effect. You mm -hmm. need to go and listen to that episode as they talk, the person that's talking about it, a Western reporter from the New York Times talks about being in a hotel in the Congo and seeing every ethnicity there. Why? Because they're there. They are there for cobalt. Mm -hmm. That's what they're there for. Everyone is there. 
And then she talks about how the folks at the hotel were offering them world-class lattes and all that stuff was just annoying to me. But the reality is what she was trying to say is the folks that live in the Congo are trying to be involved in global commerce. And she also acknowledged that China had taken a large percentage of that commerce already and that the terms were not beneficial to the, to the Congo. And as we sit in other parts of the world and say, isn't that a shame? Why did the, the Cong Congolese do that? The reason why the Congolese did that is because you're not there. You're sitting there <laughs> watching TV and saying, isn't that a shame? <laughs> you need to invest at home so that you can create terms that benefit everyone. And so that's, that's really what we have to do. Please download the episode so that you're able to listen to it. You're just incredible. And, and, and each time we begin to talk and we expand and we begin to see the possibilities because we, yeah. the, the one thing that we are still doing is we're copying every model and want to make it an African model. For mm. instance, I've been thinking in, 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 um, in the past or just recently, like, why do we always say we, we also need a one Africa passport or we mm. need one Africa currency? like but how were we before because if we're going back to Kemet and if we say we need a currency we don't need no currency mm. to do our import and, and, and export how did mm -hmm. we so if we just go back to our trade by barter like diaspora what is it that you don't need what is it that we have that you don't have and we just exchange we're going to rubbish their currency we will not need it now passport Maponga said it a couple of times here why do we need it for? We To cross the borders, we walk on our camels, we go in our rivers, we walk in every other thing. But the problem is the moment we keep saying, you know, it's because Africa doesn't have one currency. It's because we don't have one passport. It's because mm. we don't have one language. No. If we just look at everything that we have and just go back and do it the way we're having, we're going to make all other systems irrelevant. Yes. I will yes. not need it, you know? And, and so if we make these things irrelevant, so it, 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 we will not be fighting to like, oh, we need a central government that, oh, we need to go back to our own system that, oh, we need to, but those systems that we're still saying is still a copy and paste something, but in another format. But is that truly how we were in Kemet? That's where. the mm. second question. Is, that's a lot of people say, oh, you know, it's because that the leadership, I think the war, that we are fighting, that nobody is talking about, is the war of information and education. Mm. It's not a war of resources. Resources, and like I said, we're endowed by our ancestors. They can till and till until we have on endless resources undiscovered. They will never, even in their generation, all of us will die, the resources will be there. But the most important thing now the war that is so silent in as much as you are educating us they're educating themselves too they're educating right. their children too so the more we fight to know information education oh what is africa what is africa made about now chinese are learning the indigenous african languages what is mm -hmm. that and before our our narrative was like oh you see they don't, they're racist that's why they don't even know that they don't know our culture they don't teach about us but do you know that teaching about us was the empowerment to know more and to get to get it? You see, we are still just turning around. Am I crazy? Yeah, no, no, no. I hear exactly what you're saying. I think that what you're really saying, the, the 30,000 foot view is that we have to decide how we're going to interact on our terms. We don't yes. have to necessarily say, what is the Western world doing? Let's replicate it. That we don't necessarily have to do that. And I'm going to say to you that so much of that discussion around passports and the like, the Western world, Europe has done away with a lot of that. You know, I traveled on a high speed train from Italy to France and back. Yes. By the way, the only people that were really molested on that train were the brown people. They were only ones that they said, can I see your papers? Yes. Uh... So we have to look at how the Western world, and that is not a European model. 
We have to also look back in the ancient world and see that even in Kemet, people would come into Kemet and those folks that were responsible for ensuring that folks were coming in weren't trying to cause trouble, they made records of the people that traveled in and out. Oh, yes? What's wrong oh, in it? Yeah. This we would not, also do it. We would I'm also telling do you, this is, not, this, this is not their story. This is our story because it's we were own. the people <laughs> that created multinational commerce, that created such, um, situations where people of, sometimes when we say the comedic people, let me just take it a step back. We make it sound like it, it was one group of people. The documentary that, that spawned the One Africa Conference talks about the fact that Kemet was really groups of people, different groups of people. And the story of how Kemet is so, was so powerful is about how they worked together. And so we have to look at those narratives and recognize we, when we did that before, we were in at the forefront of human civilization. We were the most powerful, the most economically sound people on the planet. So there is a way to do this. And I do believe that we should be able to find ways that travel amongst the, on the continent is easier. We have to find a way to do that. I know that when I go, let's let's look at it this way. When I go to Egypt, Dr. Tata, I, mm -hmm. I could get my visa in the airport. I get it in the airport. They, they give it to me in the airport and I leave. When I'm going to Ghana, it's a lot harder. We mm -hmm. have to figure that stuff out. Yes, they do <laughs> have to figure that stuff out. We have to we have to get to the point where it's easier to actually build this relationship of commerce and communication across national borders. Borders that we did not create for the most part, by the way. We have to figure that out. And so I think that we can. I really do. We can. We can yeah. and we should do it because I mean it, I just take uh, for instance the borders between Southern Cameroons and, 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 and Nigeria. And you know, in the night. We, we used to see how smugglers would smuggle, you know, in, into the countries at, at night. Mm. And these are traders. And I was growing up like a child, even in the village, when we, 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 when we were coming back, let's just say in the night from, from whatever, from the farms or what, we could hear noise in the bushes. And my mom and or my, my, my parents were always like, oh, these are the traders that are leaving Nigeria and, and mm. going you know, uh, to, to Ghana or to, uh, coming into. So there is a way. If we don't go back to research, the problem is, like I said, we consume a lot of this crap. If we just begin to think, we take like uh, Mansa Monsa and say, he's mm. the richest man that ever existed. And then we start asking questions. How did he preserve his wealth? By that time, we didn't have banks. We didn't have uh, wire or transfer or this. He moved and empowered communities with that wealth. Now, did he have an army? How did he do it? We're not asking mm. those questions. What we're mainly doing in this Ashwabi, I call it Ashwabi, like in the uniform dance and the poetry and entertainment, it's like, oh, we're so happy. You know, you, the richest man was Mansa Munsa from Africa. Yes. Who are you telling this to? Now, mm. go back to yourself and just ask, but how? He had a lot of cattle. He had a lot of this, but how did he trade? How was his, you know, what was his pattern and his model of trading? These are case studies. Instead of us going to take some um, uh, Harvard or case studies or what, 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 and put and sit down, let us begin to use this African case studies and research into them. Like I said, why must we travel on the highways? As a matter of fact, that will need to be controlled. It's because we are too comfy. We, we're so privileged and, and eating all this toxic. We have mm. our rivers. We have our bushes. We have our camels. We have our horses. We have our cutters. If we look at the pillar, mm. how do they trade moving from one pastoral to the others? And now we sit and say, oh, no, that's primitivity. Because that's what they taught us. But if we can smuggle our way out to do our business between us without making so much noise and trying to be civilized, mm. <laughs> we will mm. figure it out. We're going to figure that shit out because mm. nothing is impossible there. We climb the hills. We have the mountains. We have the rivers. We know how to get in and out. Must we use the Chinese-made roads? Must we? That we need a passport? Mm. No. Mm. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, what you're saying is that we have to develop our own models. And we have actually a large body of data <laughs> that is based on what we've already done, right? You know, um, when you look at these prosperous nations that were in Africa, you know, they were prosperous, some of them, before we even have a name for those European nations. There was no name for them. So we can follow our own models. And that's part of what we're going to have to figure out how to do. Now, I'm not saying that Africa was a utopia and that everything was wonderful there. <laughs> Every group of people on the planet has challenges and issues that must be addressed. But I am saying, if you look at what we did, we found a way to work um, together in a manner where we did not seek to destroy each other wholeheartedly. We found a way to feed each other. We found a way to protect our interests. We found a way to commemorate and to memorialize our ancestors and our image. We found a way to create spiritual forms that work for us. We found a way to actually educate our children, to care for the elders, to take care of the dead. What more do we have to do? That's what we were doing. And so when we look at models, this is the reason why history is so important. What, what we need to do is to stop eating the toxic food. Because mm. I understand one thing that I know, and I'm going to have a queen here on Tuesday, and she's going to be telling us about this. This is so important. It, that food that we eat, call it fast food, call it what, is one of the things that block our brains. Yeah. To be honest with you. Because... Um, I am a village girl. I grew up in the village, right? Mm. Mm. We, <clears throat> I'm sorry. There was no cars and nothing. Now, don't ask me how our mothers, our fathers traded with their cattle, right? How they went to local markets and did business and educated all of us that are sitting here and making pa -pa -pa -pa, as if we were never we how did we do it sometimes right. like i said when i say we should have to stop eating toxic food they make us lazy they make us dormant they make us weak it is also a war against our intellect but we could walk kilometers to go to school to carry our water on our head to carry our children on our back now what is just stopping us we cannot even walk again without uh, breathing how many of us go on foot to say no we just want to go back to that and if we mm -hmm. say we're going back to Kemet. Why should we just choose only and say, no, you know, our ancestors did this. Do we know what our ancestors had to go through to build those pyramids? Mm. They were not eating burgers. They were not eating fast food. They ate the real food. They ate yeah. ugali morning to afternoon and evening. They drank waters from the rivers. And so they could strong. They ate vegetables, right, from the farms. And, and, and believe me, there was nothing that made them weak. So they didn't lose the courage. They 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 um, they drank pami, what we call palm wine. Okay, <laughs> they didn't have no, and they kept it fermented. They drank corn beer. So yeah, we should stop always uh, like laziness comes from this toxic food. I, I begin to think that that's also a weapon that is used against us, and we're still not getting it. Well, Tata. well, uh, Dr. Tata, I mean, clearly um, it's a weapon that's being used against us. I mean, we actually see that um, in this period, if, if, if we haven't noticed anything else, we've noticed that comorbidities are killing African people around the world. Um, the, the diabetes, the hypertension, the, all of the ailments that we have, and those things are treatable and preventable. What's giving us diabetes and hypertension and the other things that are killing us? The foods that you're talking about. That's what, that's what the problem is. The foods that are so far away from their natural form that give us, we have to eat a whole lot of it to get just a little bit of nutrition. I mean, that that is really what's killing us. And you know, the thing, this is the part that always mi is mind boggling to me, Dr. Tata. Mm -hmm. When we look at a nation like ancient Kemet and we see that they were able to create great art and have incredible writers that and thinkers that thought about the nature of the world and people who could scan the stars nonstop so they could understand astronomy. Mm -hmm. The reason why they were able to do that is because they figured out how to feed more than any other nation in the region. 
This is the part that we don't always think about. The way that you're able to get to the point where you can create great art is because not everyone has to be a farmer. Mm -hmm. Why is it that not everyone has to be a farmer? Because you figured out how to produce efficiently. And Dr. Tata, they were doing it in the desert. Huh. The rest of the people around there, many of them in the Mediterranean, weren't dealing with a desert climate. How does a nation in the desert produce more than nations that are lush and are dealing with irrigation from, um, from areas around them rather than um, the, the desert nation? Uh, some people say that um, uh, that ancient Kemet was viewed as the breadbasket of the Mediterranean. In other words, they were able to produce more in the, the desert than many other people were able to produce. And let's go mm -hmm. further. Let's talk about those challenges that we have. Not only were they producing in the desert, but you've got to imagine that, that if a lesser people, that a lesser people had arrived in that region, they would have said, wow. We've been in the desert. It's really hard. It's a difficult life. But now here's this wonderful lit river, and I can actually live along the river, the river that is now known as the as a Nile that we actually should call the Hopi. Mm -hmm. And I can grow food here. And then once a year, what happens to that river? It actually overflows its banks in a very violent way. It could destroy everything. A lesser people would have said, I, I came from the desert to this river. This is terrible. I'm getting out of here. This is cursed. But in fact, what African people did is they figured out how to live in harmony in this environment. Mm -hmm. So that that great flood, and I know that even in the United States and in many parts of the world, floods kill people, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely people get killed by floods. Can you imagine living in such harmony with your landscape that a flood is a blessing and not a curse? They figured out how to make a flood work for them. Yes. And in yes. many ways, what we have to ask ourselves is, where is the flood where you are? Where is that thing, African, wherever you live today, that you might see as a challenge or a curse that, in fact, if you use it effectively, is a blessing? Where is the flood where you live? Mm-hmm. And so they were able to live in harmony and produce lots of food and not the kind of food that you that we were talking about earlier, Dr. Tata, the stuff that's killing us, that's giving us hypertension and high cholesterol and, and asthma and all those things that are affected also by our diet. They figured out how to do it. We can do this again. We can do this again, but we have to go back to our models. To our models. Exactly. That's, yeah. that, that, that was the, what I said. We, we just forgot. Mm -hmm. It's not that we were not capable because let's, let's get this straight. We, we forgot because yes, uh, the trauma, they, 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 they haven't to forget about us and to build their, their nations and their civilization. We kind of got tired and forgot, but now the, the melanin is reconnecting us. And then we begin to ask questions. How can somebody people that, you know, we know it even in the, the Bushman of the Kalahari. When we go to just simple it, the stories that we narrate amongst ourselves and we look at them again from a conscious mind now mm -hmm. that we know, you begin to figure out the whole thing. It's just it's, it's just a simple. Yeah. Now, when we, when we sit and get this kind of education with experts like you, and then we go back and relax, you know, and mind our African business and begin to look at those things again with a conscious eye, you begin to see the difference. Because how can you tell me uh, the, 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 the primitive man that they call that discovered fire just by taking two pieces of stone, cracking it, and fire came out? Whoever knew that anything will happen like that? And they keep mm. telling us. And we do a lot of these scientific things, my brother. But it's just mm. that we don't put it and document it like you're saying in a scientific. I know a, a popular soup. In my village, in my dialect, we call it achu soup. You know, you take palm oil and then you take the, the, the limestone and then you, you put it, it trans it, it, it transforms it and, it into a chemical reaction and then this soup becomes yellow. Mm. Right. Now, if you would give it 
they, they, they to the Europeans, they will come take it, go to the laboratory, try to see this this stone <laughs> that makes it change it from right. palm oil plus water, and then it becomes yellow. But that's a scientific chemical reaction. Yeah. But in the village, our mothers just do it, even from you know uh, 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 the the wood or the ashes, and they could produce that soup, and we eat with it. Please give this one to the Caucasians and see mm. the kind of literature and everything that they'll bring out of it. Mm. But because we're just normal people, we eat it, we enjoy it, and we take it like. So the fact that we don't uh, uh, document doesn't mean that we're primitive, isn't it? That's right. That's right. And let's be clear. We were the ones that taught the European to depend on and to utilize science. Mm -hmm. Europeans didn't develop science. They got that from us. The world's first um, the world's first dentist. Have you seen an image of the world's first dentist? Post it. Post uh, it. The, you might have seen it, but I want, I want us to share it with the audience. Do you have it? The world's first dentist. The world's first gynecologist. The world's first... I mean, we're talking about people who um, gave science to the world. Mm -hmm. That's who we are. That's who we are. And as long as we begin to understand that science is in the province of the African, that this is not something that the European developed, we'll actually get to the point where we use science the way that it was meant to be used, not to exploit people, not to harm people, but to create societies that work for everyone and that is the narrative that we that we should show this is an image of the world's first dentist here he is <sighs> this king here the first recorded oh. dentist all right i'm bringing it up look at him his name is hesse ra hesse mm -hmm. ra and, you know, there are those that would like you to believe that we're not talking about Africans. Now, mm -hmm. Dr. Tata, that you see his hairstyle. My father had that hairstyle in the 70s. That is, if that's not a well-groomed Afro with his Is large, it not mine? This is also know. my kinky hair. Yes. Look at the little circles. They're, dep they're depicting yes. his hair. This is the world's first dentist. By the way, he was also a learned man who could write. If you look over his shoulder, you'll see that he was a scribe. This means that he was able to write. Yes. Remember, this is a period in ancient Kemet where writing was new for the entire world. It was not something that human beings had been doing for very long. Mm -hmm. So not only was he a scribe, not only was he a literate man, he was a dentist. And so when we think about sciences, when we think about medicine, we should not give those things to the European. We taught them. We taught them. And when you talk about those ladies in mm -hmm. your village that are doing amazing things, that have figured out how to create things that are healing and nutritious, in many ways, they are the scientists. Right? We have to understand. Remember I showed you the person that wrote the world's oldest book, Patah mm -hmm. Hotel? The first thing that he wrote, because there were 37 maxims, right? 37 things that he wrote, mm -hmm. right? The first one is, be not arrogant with your wisdom. The greatest knowledge is found amongst the women who toil all day at the grindstone. In other words, he is saying, with all of your education, some of the greatest knowledge is mm -hmm. found by those hard working women, the women that were making the soups that you were talking about, that knew actually how to um, to ensure that uh, people were, were nourished, were healed by the things that they brought up out of the ground. And so that's, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about um, how this happened, how <laughs> this happened. And if we understand the story, first of all, we're going to give the European a lot less credit, right? We're going to give them a lot less credit. And we're going to be able to say, what about who we are and what we've done allows us to figure out how to get to where we must go? And those narratives, those stories are there. We did this for tens of thousands of years. We have at least in the last 
5,000 years, we have records of what the African was doing. And I'm telling you that when Hesse Ra was alive mm -hmm. as the world's first dentist, by the way, this is at around, uh, he's nearly 4,000 years old. That's mm -hmm. how old he is, right? This is before mm -hmm. the Bible before the Quran, before the Torah. I know somebody in the audience is upset with me. I am here as a historian and a comedic priest. I'm just telling you the truth. This is before those texts existed. I want you to understand that as he was doing this, Africans found ways to live in harmony with their environment. And that is why they were able to survive and to thrive. And we can do that. We can do that. And mm -hmm. as and as Patahotep tells us, that doesn't mean that just because you have an advanced education that you're wiser than that woman that is working diligently in the in the village who is creating nutritious meals for their family. We must recognize that some of the greatest wisdom is amongst them as well. Mm -hmm. And by the way, uh, when I finally meet you, Dr. Tata, if you don't share a bowl of that soup with me, I'm going to be upset. <laughs> I want to mm -hmm. see what it's like. <laughs> It's, 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 a, it's a traditional delicacy. It's a traditional delicacy. You go everywhere. It's just like the, the normal soup that the Akan people, you know, we eat from the same bowl and we, we you know. Yes, you yes, know. yes, yes. It's a very popular dish if you if you, if you you look uh, look it up. Ooh. They call it achu. And what is it achu, called again? Achu. <laughs> achu. achu. I'm going to make sure that when I get yeah. back to and so the actual soup is the yellow soup, or if you just say the yellow soup of Cameroon, you, you will see the images. In it. It's a chemical reaction. That soup, yes. it looks like it looks like the the pumpkin sauce of Haiti, the Haiti, yes, Haiti yeah. revolutionary soup. Okay, it looks mm. like that, but no, it's not just cooked like that. It's a chemical reaction from palm mm. oil and the ashes and water and then the natural spices. It's a delicacy. Wow. It's a traditional meal. And, wow. I mean, everybody, and when you eat it and then you drink the palm wine with it, oh my God, you just made your day. <laughs> Listen, I have an image of me <laughs> drinking, tasting palm wine for the first time. Um, usually when I travel to the continent, I'm with children. So I don't usually imbibe in, in alcohol. Well, I'm going to tell you last year, I was not with kids. And I stopped on the side of the road and had some of that palm wine. I was like, this is good. Yes. I wonder if I can find this in my luggage to come back to the United States. <laughs> so, And we've been doing it for thousands of years. It's interesting now that when people think of beer, they think of Heineken, they think of Heineken, they think of Coors, they think of Amstel Light and all those other brands, when in actuality, beer is also something that was created in, in uh, ancient Africa. We created beer. We were the ones to create wine. This, these are things in the, in the purview of African people. In fact, the name that the Kemetic people used for beer was Henket, Henket. Um, and it's interesting to me today that now they'll say, have a great German beer where you are now, right? They're talking about German beer, not African beers. How about coffee? Coffee comes from the continent of Africa. But now they're gonna say, you must have the great Italian brands. Stop, these are African developments. We have to yeah. get to the point where we're benefiting from it again. Yeah, but you see, you see, that's that's the trick. That's the trick. I love this conversation because like we're saying, um, even before we got conscious, mm. Even, be even before we got conscious, I mean, I, I, I've been organizing the festivals for 20 years in Germany. And, and, mm -hmm. and I also was caught in that trap. I was also caught in that trap where, you know, yes, we get what is available. You know, the, the, the trade barriers, we, we cannot ignore that. Why our products don't actually get to us and that. But at this 22nd, at this 21st decade of the African mm. that we are today, none of this platforms you would see any okay that would just be like nice to have like export things right yes like this year in germany we're hosting the this is africa um uh expo and it's the diaspora we're going on all the diaspora to just bring you your know-how your know-how it is made by africans for africans it's the first ever that will happen mm. then, it's exactly what we're saying there's not going to be anything apart from our palm wines apart from our vegetables, apart from our soups, 
particularly the, the Haitian soup, the revelation soup, uh, uh, liberation soup is the soup that we're saying should be available everywhere on the continent mm. and the planet. Mm. And so we want to bring our traditional brews. You're even talking, today we talk about vodka. Vodka? Oh my God. We talk mm. about odonto. Just put odonto or you call aki. That's how they get our grandparents, they drank. And, and it really was like what is called today the, the vodka. It yeah. was so it's hard. And we're going to bring all that to the expo. Mm. I want from us by us. You know, everything wow. we eat our fufu, our ugali with our hands. If you if you if you give these platforms to Chinese and you go to Chinatown, who Africans will be there wearing suit and tie and trying to eat rice with steaks. But when it comes to us and we say, no, hey, we're going to dance the jumbo jumbo and we eat our fufu with our hands and we dance and we dance. And people will be like, oh, that's not culture. And we're going to say nobody's <laughs> in this place with, without an African attire because you enter yes. the German, the German uh, Renaissance Festival, the beer festival here. They have mm. their traditional wares and they drink their beer. And go and look at African mm branding and wearing those traditional wares you know it is about ed education and culture and information and the education when we talk about our minds what do we need to do now we need to just put that physical in what we're talking in the pre in, 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 in the presence isn't it so none of mm -hmm. our festivals you should be seen without having palm wine a uh, beer wine uh without having what we call sha you know without having mm -hmm. the odonto the, the brood in the village oh, and we mm -hmm. have it Without having the coconut drinks, when we go and we begin to say like, oh, cocktails, tropical fruits, look at the Caribbean islands. They all brought that thing. When we drink the beach or the sex on the beach uh, um, or all these cocktails, do they look like fruits that are grown here that are apples and, 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 and without mangoes and beers? Why do we mm. call it that it's all their brands? It is the Caribbean the Africans that brought you know, the papaya, the mango, the, yes. the citrus fruit and everything. Yes, yes. And and and, and another thing that you're really saying, uh, Dr. Tata, is that we have to be in control of the commerce for the things that we created, right? So why yes. are we running to um, make commerce with other people when in actuality what we could have just simply figured out how to do is to benefit from the things that we've already been doing, right? So other <laughs> folks have actually taken those things and now they benefit from it. And we have to get to the point where we are benefiting from the things that we have. I'm quite sure that they will sell okra soup and banku oh, yes. and kinky of course all throughout true. Europe. And there's and, nothing and wrong with that. We just have to control it. Let them buy our food. Wonderful. But we have to control it. And that's what we have to do. Instead of running to try to replicate, to, to out-European the European. Instead of trying to do that, we have to go back to our ancient ways. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We have to go. So by the expo this year, we're presenting the 55 because we said the diaspora. And yes. all the recipes in, that country, in, in each country, the drinks. They, wow. they, 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 yours, they, everything from us by us for us. Wow. And when <laughs> is your expo? Hey, we, it, because you have to be there to do the, the presentations about the civilization, it's in August, 4th to the 7th of August. Ah, I mean, I'm going to be in I'll be taking a trip, a group of folks to Kemet during that time. From the 1st to the 10th, I'll be in Kemet. And then from the 10th to the 20th, I'll be in Ghana. No problem. We're going to repeat it. Don't worry. If you miss Please it, do, because I want to come. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No, we're taking it all around. We're taking it yeah. all around. Because the first thing that we have to promote is the a, a Haitian liberation soup. All of us yes. know it. And we have to put it every restaurant everywhere in the yes. world has to have that yes, soup. Yes, 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 yes. Because I that's the freedom soup. About it. Yes, yes. I have heard <laughs> people talk about this liberation soup. And it's one of the ways, uh, Dr. Tata, it's, it's more than just feeding ourselves. It's also a way for us to celebrate the fact that we destroyed our chains, that Africans yes. undid the most difficult thing that ever happened to human beings. How could mm -hmm. we... Not, how could we not be up to the task with the problems that we have in 2022 and beyond if we actually destroyed enslavement? Can you imagine? Can so you just that's, imagine? That's really what you're saying. You're saying as we eat and drink and smile, we'll recognize that we have our own agency. 
that we can do what we need to do. In fact, we are not waiting for anyone to be born. Our ancestors have asked us to do the work. They've asked us to do the work. They've asked us to just put down everything that we've been teaching, put it on a platform. And what we intend to do, I mean, we're calling on all the diasporas worldwide to represent at This Is Africa Expo, because this is the first historic expo that we're meeting, the diaspora and the continent. But mm. it's not just coming. We have to design the Africa that we want from our eating, from our clothing. Can you imagine that industry? Can you imagine wow. that industry? Can you imagine that industry? That mm. we're about mm. So... Imagine that is when we talk about economic empowerment. It's not just a, a poem. It's not just a word. It is you enter into the place where we're going to get 50,000 to 100,000 diasporans. They eat and drink African and think mm. and dance. And all our alarms ringing at 12, 12 p.m. And we sing and dance and drum. Can you imagine? <laughs> Smacking it up. <laughs> <laughs> that would be powerful. Wow. Ooh, wow, we can wow. think it that's the new africa and can you imagine even the expos on the continent to be honest with you, this is a fact we're not just talking because like that's the knowledge of building ourselves the education and the empowerment mm. you know and, and, and a lot of people are like dr fire uh, dr susan you're on fire you, you, we needed a rocket to chase you because the speed of yes. life that you're flying, we will not yes. be able to talk with you. And that's the fact. And I was empowered by the One Africa Conference. Now you see me, I'm just different now. And, uh, um, and I'm so charged up. So what I mean is, if you look at the continent, even the expos that we do on the continent, brother, from the infrastructures to the products, it's European. Yes. To the dress code, to everything. Yes. From the canopies that we build with, to the podiums, the big, big stage that we all rent, we don't produce those things and we're doing it. But if you go to the village, I, what inspired me is I just went back to the village when we went, you know, when we went on vacation and we're celebrating in the, in the courtyard. What did we use? What were we eating with? We're eating from our banana leaves, which is now called mm. the, what, 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 what the process and the plastics we, and then we just went in the circle and we were drumming and dancing and sharing food and doing and presenting. So why do we keep leaving money even on the continent? So even the way we design our 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 event is still Europeanized. Yes. And so we go back to the village setup, and that's the replica that we want to put out here in Germany for the first time. Mm. Want to on the expo that we say this is africa you enter it you know you're in africa every other thing is plastic out there wow you think it's doable wow <laughs> wow i and and you you even heard her say that they're going to eat on the banana leaf yes instead of instead of poisoning the world no 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 We've already ordered. We're ordering. We have banana leaves. We also have a, a leaf that is called gogo leaf. These are yes. all healthy leaves. And then we have our traditional bowls, right? Yes. We call them the wooden bowls. So, yes. Yes, yes. So so you're, saying, you're saying that you, we're not going to choke the world's marine life with toxins. Yes. We're going to even eat in things that are biodegradable. Oh now, listen. These are terms that other people use. Africans live like this for tens of thousands of years and longer. Mm -hmm. So really, that's what we're talking about. That's really what we're talking about. I, I remember one time a student, an older student, a college level student said to me, when you go to Africa, do people live in huts? And first I had to say, well, you should understand Africa is a very diverse place. People live in all sorts of different um, configurations. But then at the end of that conversation, I had to say, well, brother, what's wrong with the hut? You know, it's biodegradable. Do you know that the things that you do in these housing styles, they fit better into the environment? Mm -hmm. And you think that we've advanced simply because we've created things that are destroying our world? You no, know, so we we have a lot of we have a lot of of um rethinking to do, I think is what we're what we're describing, really. Because even no. the rice that we keep saying is Chinese rice, Chinese rice is the one that we know. But African has its rice salt. And we're going to present even rice made in Africa from the Senegal rice to the yes. Ghana rice, to the Nigerian yes. rice, to the Cameroon yes. rice, even yes. just an 
expose an exhibition about rice, African rice variety. Oh my goodness. Do you want to tell me about the tubers? All the tubers that we have and their transformation. Mm. Oh wow. See, this Ooh. is Africa. <laughs> Even the hurt. You see, the brother is saying, what about the hurt? We are also trying now, and we are negotiating with architectures on the continent to come and put the traditional huts there. So we're not yeah. using any plastic. Now, why? Because when the wall sits and just makes poetry about Mother Nature, Mother mm. Africa, now we want to bring that Mother Nature in its entirety. And so yes. we're just going back to Kemet. Yes, 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 yes. My home in Ghana is circular. It's circular. So it's going to be very interesting. It's built in a non-colonial fa fashion. Um, but, you know, with all of the amenities that that we would expect in, in, in the world today, but it's built with an African aesthetic, right? I mean, four bedrooms, three baths. I mean, we there's a way to do this. There's a way for us to draw from our ancient models and to create modern models based on our ancient models. That is, when we talk about ancestor worship, sometimes people don't even recognize that ancestor worship as simple as it is, also means that we should draw from those models that these ancestors brought forward. And that is how we're going to return to power once more. Exactly. Well, Dr. Tata, I'm about to um, uh, start a class very shortly. Yes, 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 I'm we're running a board. Board. One, more, I know. one more picture. Can I show you one more picture? Oh, one yes. more picture. And yes. this time, family, I'm going to show this picture because when I look at our queen, Dr. Tata, sitting there, this is who I see. This is one of the most powerful ladies in human history, that that wonderful African dynamo known Ooh. as queen. Look at her hair on the right. Are you telling me that when you're looking over there at Dr. Tata, you're not seeing that? That's Don't who we're them. looking at. Don't this mind it. Like a, she was a head of state. She, her husband was a powerful king. Her son was a powerful king. Her grandson was a powerful king. She had the title queen mother. Hey. And if you say that she's not an African, look at the one on the left. Uh, if that's not an African, I don't know what an African is. So I want us to recognize that we have the knowledge, we have the, the know-how, we can actually surmount these things that challenge us because it is in our DNA. Greatness is who we are. We are resilient. We are rebellious. We are ingenious. The African is ascended. I'm excited. And I can't wait to get to Germany to see all of the things that you're talking about. I have not been to Germany yet. It's on my bucket list. And so I definitely need to go to see what Africans are doing in Germany. I'm not there to go to a beer garden. I'm there to see the family is what I'm going to be going to do. No, we have to. We have to put that because, uh, like, like we're saying, is there is we're reclaiming, and if we're reclaiming, yes. we we better get serious. Being That's serious right. means when we say we are not ashamed of who we are. Sometimes Ooh. we just. But when it comes to doable, we still just don't want to believe that this is the reality. But what we want That's to right. put in, in, in Germany this year at this expo in August is actually the Africa that we want to see. What city in Germany is it coming out of? Stuttgart. It's in Baden-Württemberg, in the southern, Stuttgart. one of the richest, the, the richest. You know, we only go where the, the, the people, the, well, when we yeah. are there, then everything becomes different. So yes. I want to see. I want to see. I want to see. Um, I, I'm. I'm gonna. While I can't go, I'm gonna be following it very closely. I, I, it's gonna be amazing. I mean, to see people of African descent doing powerful things in Germany, the <laughs> largest, the largest economy in Europe. I mean, let's be clear. For those of you who are in the diaspora that don't understand what uh, Sister Tata is saying here, she's talking about Africans being powerful on the continent and abroad. If this yeah. is not a measure of what we're capable of, I don't know what is. And mm -hmm. so this is so powerful. So mm -hmm. powerful. Thank you. Thank I wanna, you. Thank you. I want to make sure that folks know how they can reach me. Now, I uh, you yes. have offered for me to come back. I can't wait to come back and talk to you again. Yeah. Um, but definitely, if you want to hear more about some of the things that we're doing, some of the things that I'm doing, the classes that I'm offering in history, um, the the trips that I'm um, uh, uh, that I'm sponsoring um, all over the, the world, you can mm -hmm. actually go to Center for Maat. 
Center, C-E-N-T-E-R, for, the word for, F-O-R, Ma'at, M-A-A-T, centerformaat.com, and you'll see a lot more of what we're up to. My book is called Seven Little White Lies, The Conspiracy to Destroy the Black Self-Image, and I'm really hoping that we'll get into a dialogue family. Together, we are going to figure out exactly how to meet all of our needs. When we look at the, the, the Indian, we say, wow, look at the number of Indians, they're on their rise. We look at the Chinese, we say, oh, wow, look at the number of Chinese, they're on their rise. Do you know that there are an equal number, if not more Africans than there are Indians or Chinese? Why is no one talking about that? Africans are on their rise. And there's a lot that we're gonna be able to do. We just have to do it together. And so I'm, I'm excited. It has been wonderful talking with you, um, and I would love to talk to the Pan Africa, um, Pan African TV Daily um, uh, uh, family again. Um, we we have a lot of work to do, and I think that we can do it. We have to recognize that we have challenges, but there's no reason for us to think that we can't do these things. We can't just look at our track record. Look at our track record. We can do this, and so I'm excited. I'm excited. Thank you. Your, your fans are saying, when are you coming back? So be, don't just rush without. Do you want us to <laughs> Because you promised me this is going to be a series. Listen, and I can get you. I'll come back bi-weekly. I'll come back monthly. When you call, I will come. Because yeah. remember, Dr. Tata is in a time, she's in a time zone that works very well for me. I have evening classes. That, that's that's mm -hmm. when my schedule gets really busy. So for mm -hmm. me, we started our conversation at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I would mm -hmm. love to be able to come back and talk to you as many times as you offer. Just let me know. Um, I, 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 We can do this regularly. I would love to do this regularly and talk about very specific issues, broad issues. There's a lot mm -hmm. for us to do. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that this is the kind of platform where I get to speak to our people throughout the diaspora, throughout the world and on the continent. Let's do it. Africa rise, Africa rise, Africa rise. Ashe, Ashe, Baba, ashe, bayete, ashe. Bayete, bayete. Thank you so very much. We'll be having you anytime soon. Yes, I'll yeah. reach out to you. We'll, we'll talk, yes. we'll talk offline so we can yes. I come back really soon. Thank you, thank you. Good night you so or much. good afternoon to you. Bye. All right now, Bye. peace, family. Bye. Peace, 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 peace. Good. You can see. Um, yeah, he's gonna come back. Kalena, how uh, how fair? Uh, our, our queen is asking. Please come back. Everybody's like, come back. Yes, he's gonna come back because you want to come back because you are hungry for the Africa. Any one of you that wants them to come back, they will always come back because you know we are one. I didn't hear uh, people talking about. They've set their alarms. Um, are we still in touch? With a 12, 12 p.m. alarm, is there anybody here that can just give me a reason uh, that they have they, a reason why they have not set their alarm to 12, 12 p.m. to be ringing every day? And I know some people are saying, Dr. Tata, you said it's 23rd. Yes, I did say it's 23rd. That will drum and dance and then we repeat, you know, a credo. I am because you are. You are because I am. On 12, 12. PM 23rd to 25th. That's what we'll be doing. But it doesn't stop you from setting your alarm now. Your alarm should ring every day at 12, 12 PM because that's what connects us. We already said that code is the Ubuntu code 12, 12. Yes, I hear somebody said, Queen, I set my alarm. Good. I want to see everybody just say in the comment that they set their alarm. I'm saying it because we don't have time to waste we don't have time to lose. Make sure everybody has set his alarm to 12, 12. 12, 12 p.m. Your alarm should ring wherever you are. When I say 12, 12 p.m., it means you can set your own alarm um, in your own time. And when it's ringing, I feel it. We feel the vi vibration. You can see each time when my alarm rings, the way I jump here, like, you know, is, is it? That is the greatest thing that would awaken our consciousness. And remember, each time it's going to ring, each time it's going to ring, each time it's going to ring, it reminds you we are because we belong. That's all. 
We're not asking anything. You have your phones, you have your clocks. It doesn't cost you anything. I'm not saying go and buy. I'm not saying go and do this. Camilla, thank you. You said I said my alarm. Thank you so very much, my queen. Thank you. Who else has not done it? Sinovia has said his alarm. I know Kwame has said it. Uh, Stevie said it rings every day. Oh, Stevie Robinson. Yes. Take it to well being said. My 12 12 is always on. Please make sure if you miss any, any of the episodes that we're talking here, the first thing that will give me that signal to you is your 12 12 alarm. I don't know how to say it again. And if you said it, make sure you connect the others. Don't do it only for yourself. Don't be selfish. It's a solidarity Ubuntu alarm. It means solidarity means what? All of us. It's a sign for us to know that we are connected. It is the first sign for us to do one action in the of all our people and to respect, to respect the, the dreams of our forefathers for unity. That's why they gave us the code. It is not me because I'm a 12 12 girl. No. It is a revelation that was given to a prophet and he told us here and all of us are doing it. If we want to build Africa and it's impossible for us to even just set an alarm, how can you build Africa? If we want to unite and it's impossible for you to set an alarm, how can you unite? If we want to support one another and it's impossible for you to just set an alarm, how can we do it? If we want to connect and regain our spirituality and it's impossible for you to set an alarm, something that doesn't take you a second to set an alarm, wow, then don't even dream of unity. Don't even dream of it. And nobody owns it. Nobody gave. It is our ancestors that gave us that code. It is your time, African. Set your solidarity alarm at 12 12. When it rings, just say, I am because you are. Just meditate it. It should be your prayer, morning, afternoon, evening. Your alarm rings, you just say, I am because we are. If you have your djembe or you have your drum or you have your whatever, you just drum it. Now we're getting another prophecy. Make sure you drink your water and mind your African business. Now, do you know what this means? Water, Africans, go and re go and research. Just go and research for God's sake. Don't come here and think that uh, Dr. Susan just goes and cooks some things and because, you know, she, she, she just brings some things. No. Set your alarms at 12, 12 p.m. 12, 12. Why did they not give us one? I cannot say. Why did they not give us 13, 13? I cannot say. Why did they not give us 11 and 12 or even something? Why did they give us 12, 12? I cannot explain. If we don't listen to our ancestors call and just do one thing that they, they are there fighting for a liberation and they say, do this in memory of me. Do this. When it rings, remember me. I remember you. Anywhere on the continent. So please just do it. Good. I like to think <laughs> Jaravan is saying it's happening. What is happening with 12 12 here? Set your alarm. Queen Jaravas. I know you've been, Grace, you've been missing here. You owe us even an apology where you've been all this while. Maybe you traveled somewhere. Did you go to Dubai? Let, let's begin to see those that are running away from the continent and going and climbing camels somewhere and making selfies. What a shame. Bring that money. Let's build Africa. Okay. Set your alarms in the galaxy of 12. So 12 represents one galaxy and you are a galaxy already. So you have a, a, a galaxy of 12. They set an alarm at 12, 12. The next galaxy at 12, 12. Make sure you create it. And then we'll begin to tell you as the message comes every day, every day, every day. Imagine our alarms ring. Exactly. That's what Papa Chizzy is saying. Imagine our alarms ring 12, 12, 365 days just like that. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? that our alarms are ringing every corner of the world. The one point, how many, uh, uh, the three uh, on the continent and 140 million in the diaspora at 12, 12, all our alarms are ringing. Can you just imagine? I don't want to let the card out of the bag. You already know it anyway. So make sure you're setting it before I even tell you something that I have to tell you now. Now, the next thing is, we're not going to be long. Uh, <laughs> we're going to end up because I really just want to remind you. This week, uh, we have our brother, 
run SPS that is coming up tomorrow. It's still going to be about the message of one unity, the one Africa conference. But, in, you know, in this very format, all the great speakers that were there and sharing this vibe with us, because like I said, it's the happy. We're all happy. We're all happy movement. We're all happy people. So all of them would be coming and, you know, um, uh, sharing the experience. And tomorrow we have uh, King Ron Spears. You know, he's a village man like me. Even though born on the continent, but a village man like me. <laughs> so you see. And you know what? Of course, we had designed to start doing also our 12 12 um a pm news or 12 12 because maybe i, I just want to appear one day on 12 12 and i hear your alarms ringing I, I would have to do that you remember the day i surprised you on who is watching in the morning show and i saw everybody pew, pew, i'm here i'm here i'm here that's what i'm going to be doing somebody said we have to be consequential we have to say things and we are consequential about it if we mean the unity if we mean that we really love ourselves, if we want to say, oh, no, and stop always like, ah, you, we cannot unite because we don't support each other. Oh, we are too jealous. Oh, we are too this. No way. That was before May. Beautiful May is coming here and is telling us to set your alarm. That is the curse that is uplifting upon us. Just do it in the name of unity of Africa. Okay. So after this week, when we're going to round up, we are going to get into the Africa Expo that we're talking about. It's a global expo for all Africans. For the first time. Let, let me just say it's a one Africa Expo. <laughs> because when I say it like this, then it sounds more. But, but we decided to rebrand it. This is Africa. It means we are affirming this is really who we are. So now imagine you're saying this is Africa and then you want to do something that doesn't look like Africa from the infrastructure to our food, to our eating habit, to our dance, to everything that is us. Now we know a lot of black businesses worldwide. Whether those that are massages, those that are, oh my goodness, look at the competence. Now we get people every day. I'm a retired nurse. I'm going to bring your competence to that expo. People that are in service industry, everything that the African can create, whether you are doing an online business or anything, just come to that expo. Just come. Just come. We're going to receive you. We have enough space. We've reserved 20,000 square meters. We call it the African village. It's going to accommodate all of us on the continent. OK, please make sure you start booking your visas now. Those of us in the diaspora, like in places we don't need visas, we just need from the Americans and the Caribbean, they waiver visas. OK, make sure you already are applying for your waiver visas now. I said it from the 4th to the 7th of August. But you know what? We're going to start from the 31st and we take the whole week because that, that those four days are just the days where we exhibit. Now, Queen uh, Bentley is with me here in Germany, and we are the ones on the team ready to receive all of you. You see the Queen, she's always here. So it's not just a festival. It's, it's, it's really an expo where Africans for the first time are showing their know-how. I have, we from the organization of the Africa We Want Global have paid for that place. You don't need to worry about anything. Come with your competence come with your know-how we we are we are ordering more than 200 200 you know we're just saying 200 for now but we intend to order more than 500 to 600 table spaces where you can exhibit your know-how like i said the village will accommodate all of us and Jay Edward is saying, are we going to see it on YouTube? You know what YouTube does when we do things like that. We intend to also do it virtual. But you know, when we'll be playing our music, YouTube is going to bring down everything, even though we're really going to be drumming a lot. Okay. Yes, it's going to be because pa Pan African Daily TV is going to have an official stand there where we're going to broadcast everything live. You know, but everybody that is going to be there is going to set their, their, their social media space on that point because this is africa this is africa where the diaspora africans bring their know-how to the platform to a global space anything that you can do 
Now, be, why did we really have to come up and be cracking in this space? Because we're always talking about support black businesses. Where are the black businesses? Where are they? What does it take us to meet, uh, meet every three months on an expo anywhere? Just bring all of us our know-how. How are we going to promote and develop our own business and economic models? If we don't leave our comfort zones and be there and connect and get to know each other, you know, and share our know-how and our businesses. A lot of Africans are doing a lot of things. How do we know? Africans are busy creating. The ones that are only your neighbors that have businesses, you don't even have an idea. We have Africans that are doing import and export. We have Africans that are building garages, that have schools, that have online businesses. How do you know? So sometimes when we talk, oh, we have to put our money where our mouth is, but then we're not giving people the platform. Where should we put our money? And then we see the big, big system start telling us about minerals. They come start telling us about um, diamonds. No, we are the common people, the village people. Just bring the little thing you can sell. Is it a service? Is it a talent? Is it a know-how? Are you a mechanic? Are you a technician? Are you a carpenter? Are you a designer? Are you a teller? Are you a braider? Everything. That's the Africa rice we're talking about. So we should not only come here and talk and talk and talk. We should talk and do. And on that expo, like I was saying, we're going to present the original. So I need all of you to come so that we build those herds, like in the village. And we have ordered more than 10,000 banana leaves. Like I said, we're going to be eating from our banana leaves. What is our rice? We're going to eat like that. What about that? And we're going to dress in our uniforms. We're going to be dancing and drumming to 12 12. It is now, my people. Where are we going to, when are we going to exhibit the Africa we want? Is it just a poetry? Is this just poem? Are we just dreaming about it? Are we just joking about it? Where are we going to exhibit this knowledge that all our ancestors, our scholars, our experts have been teaching us on the Pan-African Daily for two years now? How are we going to implement it? So we figure it out and say, we have to exhibit that knowledge. Are you a teacher? Are you a nurse? What kind of talent do you have? First of all, let's meet. Exhibit that talent among us. Now, if we, if we need a service online, we know our brother, our sisters in the America, in the Caribbean is doing it. If we need our plantains or we need our fufu or we need our drums or we need our ugali or we need our fabrics, we know that the, the people on the continent is going to supply us. When are we going to make that happen, Africa? When are we going to remove the talk and put it into the action? If we don't build the spaces where we connect. But we, but we, we see our leaders running to Dubai Expo running to China Expo. What are the China Expo? Do you think they think about me and you? No. We have to create our own expo. We are creating our own, okay? So 4th to the 7th of August are the official days, but you can already come in. And you know what? We're reserving another space on the expo ground because what we're trying to do is like, we want to stay on spot. We don't want to come and then begin to give our monies again to all the hotels. It, it, you know, we're always doing these mistakes, always putting those monies, as we say, in a place that is not supposed to be. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Hey, I need to drink water in my, my African business. We have reserved a whole place that could take up to 100 campings. And we're going to bring our camping bags. Just bring your camping bags. You're not paying for it. Like I said, we already paid for it, for the space and for the camping. Just bring your camping bags. Because we have four days or five days. It's too short a time. So we have to be on the festival ground. Okay? Everything is already there. Toilets are there. We have a swimming pool just uh, uh, behind. You know, we, we have bathing facilities and everything. So book your ticket. All you need is just your ticket and your contact card and your business card. All right. And your brochures. 
and then you put some you know hand luggage of some samples that is all why do we sit and only talk and talk and talk give this possibility of the resources and the information we have china is beating you down so we are doing the app the diaspora expo in germany this year next year or even before the end of this year we can do it in america we can do it on the continent we're doing it everywhere but we have to bring our skills on the platform from us to us by us just take your hand luggage book your ticket now save some money okay the space is there for you for free you're not paying for any space we're giving you the space for free we're giving you the accommodation, the, the camping place for free. But if you want to rent your hotels there, there are also hotels around it. We're in Germany, okay? And, and so, yes, you can. But we want to stay there and celebrate what we're talking all the day. We want to implement what Professor James Small, Dr. Leonard Jeffrey said, all of this world scholars, Professor Pielo Lumumba, Maponga Joshua has been preaching to us. Let us work together. Let us unite together. How are we going to start working together? If we don't meet, if we don't exhibit our talent, who is going to know who is doing what? Huh? So it's time. All right. So from next week, we're going to really give you a, a lot, a lot. Economic. Let's keep our money there. Let's buy only our own. But how do we know how to buy our own? If you don't bring it, if we don't expose it, if we don't share, if we don't relate, if we don't connect. How am I going to know that I can transfer or we can connect or we can support? Bring your projects. Most of you in the diaspora have projects on the continent. How do we know? Now, when the Muzungus take, take their own and begin to say, yes, we're the ones supporting Africa, and then we sit behind and begin to grumble and begin to say, oh, they're changing. We have to change narrative. No, you cannot just change narrative by only talking. Changing narratives means just show them the picture. Show them what you can do. Present the African village, our architecture, our food, our dance, our music, our fabrics, our everything. Just show them. The media will pick it and run with it. But if we only sit and they do it for us and then we complain. How many of our children can beat the djembe? How many, how many of our children have even seen one? But when we do these festivals, you see the Mzungus bring their children, they pay for their workshops, they lend the drums. Tomorrow, when they start drumming it, Africans will be the first people to say, oh, you see, they're taking our things. Do your things, nobody will take it. Okay? So like I said, I've done my own. Own. I've, take the I've taken the place, I've paid for it, and we're struggling to make you comfortable. Just bring your business, bring your business card, bring your sampling, bring your everything, and let's eat our fufu and dance and, and 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 do our things and set our alarms and sometimes our children will begin to say our our elders they met in germany and they united and so we're going to keep, throw away all 1884 1884 for god's sake we'll never leave our mouth if we don't change the story 1884 would never leave that's why we keep saying it because there's never been any other conference they've never been on we're talking about the one africa conference because they created it if it wasn't, there would be nothing that we'll be talking about it. We'll be talking always about the past. So we have to create the future. We have to create the present. We have to create everything. Artists are already signing in from Brazil, from the continent, from China. Artists are the ones that are always looking for opportunities like that. But we are saying, yes, it's a festival, but it's an expo. Let us learn into trade. What are diasporans doing? So when we say you must not go to the continent, you must not go to the continent. But you can sell. We have digital spaces now. We must not walk every day in the morning like, like slaves anymore. Your alarm is ringing. You have to run to work. You, have to, you don't have time to spend with your wife. You don't have time to spend with your children. And you wonder why our homes are breaking? But imagine we trade among ourselves. Keep our money amongst ourselves. We relax. We go for walk. We do anything we want to do. We drink water anytime. You know, we call it any time because we have the time. Somebody is just stealing your own time and we don't have time. And we are tired. So please come. Exactly. Like you're saying, we have to stop. We have to educate our people. Stop bleaching your skins. Stop, stop anything. But where do we have to do that? It's not just sitting on, on and just typing a message. Come there. It's work. 
when we say we we, we we need the workers, we have work. This is exactly where we want to start doing that work. Where we want to start doing that work. So sacrifice and save some money, my people. We have three months. Let's, let's just say, I mean, two months, as a matter of fact. We, we have two months, but it's three months, as a matter of fact. Save some money for your ticket. If you go online now and start looking for your ticket, you're going to get cheap tickets. Very cheap ones. Okay? Look for the agencies that are, you know, giving. And, and some of the, 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 the ones, the spaces on it. So please come. Just come. Come and let us sit and look at each other. And smell each other. Hawk each other. You know. And, and do the real things that we used to do, like the village people. <laughs> <laughs> exactly and put some sunshine on ourselves let us meet in the middle people are saying yes things like this are supposed to happen on the continent of course it should happen on the continent but we are everywhere let us meet in the middle we have not never i've said this one million times did we ever question why the berlin conference took place in germany the same thing like we say we, we're just talking about things we're not we're not doing our research we're not questioning Ask yourself, why did they meet in Germany? Why? We're not asking that thing. We're just saying, oh, they met in Germany. Do they? Th do you think that they, they're really stupid that they did not consult each other among the 38 European countries that met? Did you say, Fran did you think that France was not already saying, oh, I want to be, or, or Rome, or, Rome or, or Italy or anything? Why did they meet in Germany? Is the reason why we should meet not just the reason why but it's because germany is in the middle and germany is closer to africa we even have a saying it's 15 kilometers from germany to africa germany is the closest to africa that's why if we put all our servers here we're putting it automatically on the continent so don't just sit and call names and we just always like oh yeah because it's the west is the that no let us meet in the middle those of you that are afraid to go to the continent, let's first of all meet here because you're afraid. Oh, you don't know how, how the houses are. All oh, the mosquitoes in Germany, there are no mosquitoes. Infrastructures are good. Okay? E -e water. For, I mean, for all of those of us that are still not village enough, let's just meet in the middle, take away that fear of going to the continent. So if you first of all meet me, touch me, see me, a village girl, then you believe. Someone was saying we should start making our own black Jesus. Yes, that's what we want to see. We want to see before we believe. Come and see me. Come and see me when I'm real. Or I'm, you know, they're too much copies. <laughs> they're too much copies. You see a lot of us just black and, and walking and talk black. But if you look, it, it, some of us are just copies. Do you believe that? The, it is. The spirit is gone. What is inside there is something else. So don't be fooled. We have to meet and really smell each other. <laughs> when I say smell each other, like we dance and eat with each other, then we really know, are we really real? Okay. So yes, I want to invite you to that beautiful session. And we're going to be giving you more information, saying they're going to be recipes, cooking, eating together, um, awarding ourselves, um, crediting ourselves. They're going to be just a lot of things to do for the first time. The diaspora meet its continent okay so thank you uh tomorrow we're looking forward to host um ron spears the king of the village born in the in the in the diaspora but it's so it's so contaminated by his village that he cannot leave it okay somewhere in gambia or anywhere on the continent so yes hmm we can't wait to have him tomorrow. And on Saturday, I'm still waiting. I'm very sure we're going to get Queen Mother of Haiti, Mama Bello. Um, Mama Bello might be here on Saturday or Sunday. And we're still also waiting to hear from Baba Smalls. Um, you know, all of them are just chilling. Mama Rosalind, uh, Dr. Jeffries, all of them would come back to just share that beautiful One Africa conference. You see, this is what I love. When I, when I keep saying about this One Africa, people think I'm just upset. I'm just obsessed, not upset, obsessed. Because if we don't talk about the One Africa Conference, we're going to be talking about Berlin 1884. We don't have time for that.
We have to create the new narratives and start singing only that. Oh, the One Africa Conference in Detroit. Oh, the One Africa Black Conference. Oh, the One Africa Conference. That's the new narratives. That's the new Africa. So come to Germany. We're going to create the new unity. So our children will grow up to say, oh, our fathers, our ancestors, they met and they danced and they celebrated. That's the positive. That's the vibe. Okay? Create the Africa that we want. Tell our own stories by ourselves for us. Okay? Yeah. So we see us tomorrow. Hmm. Even though small, I bet I could count at least a thousand African people, nations in the Caribbean. Of course. All are Africans. Like I said, the Mzungus are already fighting us now to say, you know what? Don't begin to claim that Africa like it's only for you. It's mother of civilization. It's cradle of humanity. It's all us. So sit there and be waiting and think that these are still coming where they will say no. It's because they're brown or they melanated or they chocolated. You see the way they're even distorting everything. And now and we know it's the cradle of humanity. Maybe we should just not even start saying cradle of humanity. That could be maybe okay. But right now, everybody's claiming position and say, no, we all belong to Mother Africa. So how are we going to do it? It's going to be a fight, even on the Africa now. So we're still talking about the political systems going and taking some few minerals and we're there complaining. What do you want to do with the minerals? I keep asking us every day. Apart from it that you hear that they do business, fiat currency, what do you do with it? Eh? Go to Ghana coast and you see the kings wearing this thing like nothing. <laughs> they eat it. And someone just come and tell his diamond, a, a stone. What's the difference between the stone? Wow. Hey, something you cannot even eat. He's just, just running and following money because they tell us, go back to the village. And you understand that everything is precious diamond. From the air you breathe to eating with your fingers to jumping in the rain at the diamonds. And, and they'll be fooling you about something that you don't even have the technology. How many years we're all growing old to go and be digging some places to remove some stones and go and sell for what? Instead of us setting our alarms and be dancing and enjoying life and, and, and it just be, let them work and we eat and dance <laughs> and celebrate. Why must you work? Can't you just also enjoy it? Everything is precious. Take your time, relax. Must you work? Oh, we have to work to build a continent. Oh, we have to do. You don't need to work. We just need to enjoy. That's what we're made for. That's what the creator made for us. He didn't give us the technology to go and be digging things, to go and create something that people walk like work halits and they have no life in them and you begin to admire. For what? You have enough to eat and to feed yourself and to relax and to enjoy life. You have enough. Stop copying bad examples. Private jet. You'll be alone in that jet. And you'll be so lonely, you don't even want to believe it. <laughs> and, and, and someone, like my husband used to say, you know, a, a limousine. <laughs> it's just as lonely as it is. Why do you think they make only one seat? Because they keep cutting you away and making you feel like a king. Can you be lonely without your people? Can you be happy without people? In Africa, in the village, we said, your money is your people. They count you and they know you're a rich man from your village and your compound. And how many children are crying day and night. The happiness, the how many wives you marry, the how many cattle you have, the how many farms you have. That's riches. Can you argue with me? Go and argue with your ancestors. Can you argue with me? That's the village girl speaking. Why do you think they come and they want to copy it? Now we're only copying the wrong thing. And then, oh, we are cruising. We are cruising. With who? <laughs> With who? Oh, I have just one wife and this. For what? And I have just two kids and three. For why? Why? Just go back and do what your grandmothers, your grandparents, your grandfathers did. And that's why they lived longer. They never died. Just go back and take your village chewing stick. We're going to present all these things at the expo. It's a chewing stick. It's a magical stick. And it heals. There's no fluorid, anything to block your third eye in it. And we survived. Okay? And we survived. We were more healthy. Drunk from the rivers. 
and our all kind of insects. Nothing happened. <laughs> Caterpillars and bees or whatever, crickets. <clears throat> we are ordering all these things to present at the expo in Tübingen. Focus is agriculture, our art, our fashion. We're going to do exposés on it. Okay? Yes. We show all the different, different insects that, but if you go to China and you see them eating their cockroaches and they say, like, eh, huh, wait a minute, don't begin to use your own things that God gave you as an African, you know, to feed yourself and to make money out of it. Go and begin to take other people's things and use, and then you complain how we don't have money. Tell me what at any continent on this planet that God blessed like you. But you just deny. Why do you think our ancestors are always reminding us to set your tooth of a lamb? Because you refuse it and you say you want the Muzungu, you want their education, you want their civilization, you want their this, you want their road. And you're crying. We cry because we run away from our own things. We suffer because we, we deny ourselves. Because we deny what the creator gave us. We deny what our ancestors gave us. We deny everything. We deny even the color that they get to us and we're complaining and you imagine how much money you save on buying those things just imagine how much money and we keep giving it and then you cry poverty why do you give it <laughs> hmm? so we have to go back when we keep saying we go back not going back means oh i have to go now to my village and i start smiling and i wear african clothes and then i'm african just use anything that you have but the first thing, put your alarms on. 12, 12. That's the magic code. I don't know how to tell you. I cannot expose everything to you. Just do it first and then you will see. You just see. That's how they did in Kemet. They run their bells. They were there. Where do you think the clocks and the alarm and the church bells that you see in the civilized world came from? Africans. Where do you think it came from? Huh? So please. Let us begin to use what we have and trade among ourselves. They went to the Tat market. It's a local village market. And I always accompany my mother. And each one will bring this one. This one bring yam. This one bring potatoes. This one bring cassava. This one bring cocoa yams. This one bring fufu. This one bring corn. This one bring this. And it, you, you see the market women, we're just there. The mothers, busy. And it, it, at the break time, we hang out at the bar and we drank. And they dance, you know, it, with an Africa, there's nothing without no music. That's why even at the expo, the biggest part is the entertainment. We cannot live without our drums. No, we are sick because we just don't have it. We're not drumming enough. We're not enjoying enough. Now, why do you think you're sick? Why do you think we complain about sickness? We complain about sickness because we have lesser time to laugh. And to dance. So we're giving 80% of the work, work, and the loneliness. Now we have to come back. Hmm? So imagine if we just have enough and we trade and we know that Sister Stevie is doing this and we support her and she doesn't need to get up every morning. And Sister Stevie, you don't need the whole world to show that you're rich. Do you need it? If you want to get the whole world, what is every other person on the continent, the children on the continent? Do you know that the rich people are amassing wealth? It is normally world that would have been divided equally and everybody would be comfortable. That's the way the creator made it. So, but if I am, like, like we say, greedy and I want to own a lot, bank accounts here, do you know you're just sitting on the wealth of the poor? So think. Just get what you need. Don't get too much. Yes, luxuries, we always have the, the luxuries. But don't get too much. Don't, I must feel this. I must get this. I must own this. You, you have one car. I want to own three. You have this. That's the sickness that is killing us. Material. And when we have it, now we're going to Dubai to ride camels. Oh, my goodness. Camels are there for free. <laughs> We've never seen lions and we see lions and we watch Lion King. And even uh, most of us have um, plastic lions as toys just to get a feeling of lions. But you are a lioness. You were given those things for free. <laughs> and, they're, and they're running about. I think even the lions are asking, where are my own counterparts? 
They are there in Serengeti. They are there in Moshi. We have the tallest and the most comfortable mountain. Kilimanjaro, for God's sake. Have you ever been there? I have not. And that's why I keep crying every day. How can I come and die on this universe? I have never been to Kilimanjaro. I've never been to, to no, I don't want to call that name Lake, uh, Lake Victoria in, in Zimbabwe because we found the original name. So you can Google and tap it. And stop calling all those names Lake Victoria or like this. They have their original names. And we're Googling all those names. Just imagine you've never been there. The rainbow, the rainbow the lake and the rivers. How many? And you're going to come here and die and go without seeing one, without eating potatoes, sweet potatoes, banana. I mean, original banana, not plastic banana. Okay. You've never eaten cassava. Have you even, you, you ate cassava, maybe like the tuba. Have you eaten cassava leaves as spinach? Wow. <laughs> Have you? Now we're talking about the pumpkin soup in Haiti. Have you eaten pumpkin leaves and the stem? That's how the African is. We consume everything from the stem to the tubers to the leaves. That's how we eat as complete human beings. And that's what we're going to do in Germany. We're going to show you all the plants and the transformation. So you can order, you can start your African businesses. They're everywhere on the continent. So we eat organic. We produce what we eat. African shops that are having those things. Buy from them. Look for African stores in your neighborhood. But if you want to look at the product, don't buy the made in China. Hmm? They call it pondu. Pondu is the cassava leaf. It's so nice, so sweet. Hey, have you eaten bush meat? Bush meat? Come on. And, and we want to be Africans. And we want to go back to our own way to, to literature, to academic, to be African. Eat bush meat with your fingers and lick it like this. Hey, you will never come back. You will just stay. You will be strong. You will be as a rock. Okay. And when we eat the, we'll drink palm wine and eat bitter cola. Bitter cola is very good, you know, for particularly for the reproductive systems because everything we ate was healing. You understand? I'm not just saying like I'm exaggerating or saying anything. Every crop that we had was a healing because when we eat the real food, we don't die. That's the, that's the, that's the thing that I said, hmm, some of those things is too much. It's too much. So begin to sell your too much, too much riches. If you have too much that you don't even know how you do, or most of us car loans here, go and give them back. Buy bicycles and replace with some. And it's still cool. <laughs> or your rollers. Okay. Or foot. Go on foot. Take a walk. Do you, 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 why do you think, particularly like in the Americans, they made it so impossible because they just don't want us <laughs> Senovia said my husband loves bush meat yes it's so sweet when you eat it with a goosey soup and pounded yam fufu you know with cassava leaves in it <sighs> what are we doing you know so yes go to African shops and ask all these things we're giving you all the recipes we'll give you all the things that you can buy and these are all things that dis detox they all detox everything that we're saying so just imagine we just be eating fast, 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 fast. No, we're going to eat slow, slow, slow. All right? And we'll teach you how to make fufu, how to make ugali. Very fast. It's five minutes. You do the whole thing. Pen some water and just take some fufu and make some this and put some cassava leaves and like, wow. Come and look at our village mothers, our, 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 our queens in the village. They cook this thing here and save the whole nation. And we are here. Oh, I run a catering service and I cook for 50 people and I have to take time. Because we eat wrong food. We're lazy. We're weak. We're sick. Go and look at how mothers fed the whole villages when, they, when our kings went to war. Learn your history. Not just the academic one. I'm talking about a foot soldier these days. Okay? They fed the whole war. They, they, they fed the communities. And today they're telling us, oh, women in the West, they built their civilization when their men went to war and were killed. I said, all these things you're learning to do, our great-grandparents did it centuries ago. Please stop it. One, two children. They had 12, 15, 20, 
and still went to work and still fed the whole community. Do you want to compare? You can beat them, join them, right? So yes, try it, try it, try it. We're going to be doing cook cook workshops the whole time, how to make ugali, how to make fufu, and you can eat it with everything. Okay, how to boil potatoes, how to fry it. And it's, it's the same fast things, you know, but because somebody told you, no, you have to stand on the roadway and just buy and take and go. Even these potatoes that I'm telling you, sweet potatoes, you can cook it, hold it in your hand and you're biting and going. Everything is for the street. It's fast, but healthy. Who told you told you that oh you need to go and pound fufu and, and and which will take your time out of work no we have them now in powder form you can prepare it keep it in the fridge for one week you just warm it because it's organic it doesn't get sour you know we get the muco on our food because it's all chemicals but our own you can keep it we cook food my grandmother will cook food and we eat for two weeks and they, even the longer the sweeter and we, we love to eat only the, the sleeping one <laughs> because the sleeping one was so good. <laughs> the sleeping ones were so good, right? So go back to your roots and you'll live longer. You'll live healthy and you have the abundance. I can teach you all tricks, all right? And that's why you see even the toys. When we say, oh, we go to hmm, Disney World and we buy this to our kids. You know what we played with? You know it, all of you in the Caribbean, even in America, if you were watching your grandmothers, they did all those things because they never left their culture. They never, even in Haiti, in Brazil, in Colombia, all where our people are, they know those games still today. Our children Im always emulated their parents. And so when my, when my mom, they would go to the farms and we, we were back in the compound, what we do, we do mommy and papa. Do you don't know mommy and papa? And we begin to do everything that we saw them doing cook we cook in the tomatoes containers you know it isn't it <laughs> you know it and then we'll ask the mommy and papa and you see the papa quarreling with the mommy and everything like that everything that we saw them do when they go to farm we live back and do those things and we even slept <laughs> and we even pretend that that you know mommy would you know so that is it how do you want to learn how do you want to oh we have to go back to our culture oh, we have to do that yeah. going back to your culture is just doing it just doing those things, okay? Just doing it. Just going back to who we are. Doing our own things unapologetically. Eat our fufu and lick our fingers. It's so sweet. That's connecting back to your nature. Imagine Mother Africa gave us everything. And then we come now and we're using cutleries and we're using plastic. And then we call it civilization. Plastic. If you give banana leaves eh, to the Caucasians, you have to buy a banana leaf for hundreds of dollars, and you'll be proud doing it. But we have it for free. Now we're giving it as, as projects for our youth on the continent. Harvest us 10,000, 50,000 pieces of banana leaves because that's what we're going to use at the expo for four days. That's a project. Because if you go to my father's compound in the village and they're just there. So we're going to do the banana leaves eating and then we're going to package some like the cookies that you take at home. All right. You can chill it. Take it to America. Put it in the fridge. It's still going to be there. I guarantee you. I go to the continent when I'm coming back. I chill those things. Bring them back. Nothing happens. Healthy. It's in a banana leaf and cooked with products that have not been tempered with. Palm oil. We're going to show you the palm nuts that comes from that produces palm oil and even in that palm oil they still have the massage oil the most healthiest body massage where do we clean our babies with and take out all the acne and everything comes from the oil of the not of the palm oil everything was given to you african and then we still use the chaffs of those knots and we use it as fire in the village we have everything now you have to buy everything. Oh, my God. Please, sisters, brothers, family. <laughs> I know most of you out there are watching me, uh, but those on the continent are really here. I can guarantee you they're really here. They're not sleeping. <laughs> they're really here. And um, let us welcome our brother um, tomorrow, and he's going to be sharing his experience with us. And we we are going to do the, 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 the village thing, you know, poetry, poems, laugh, dance, sing our songs, play jambes. 
please once more don't forget to set your alarms if you if, if you join us late 12 12 just do it okay set your alarms and nothing will go wrong with you remind you every day 360 days every 12 12 p.m i am because we are that's a special alarm that you just set for me and you it's not the alarm that takes you to work it's not the alarm that reminds you about your program this one is for us let's do something for us for our unity set your alarms when it rings you just i am because you are i am you are because i am that's all it doesn't take anything you don't pay anything for you you're not going to do any money transfer you're not going to contribute to do anything it's your own but you decide whether you want to connect with your people worldwide or not set your alarm and let it be ringing and you just remember me i remember you okay all right so good night i love you so much so much so much <laughs> i hear people still say oh please don't go i miss playing doctor stay at home yeah <laughs> you see you miss playing that game we all know it but mommy and papa that one is the child psychology that's why when i hear people come here like oh you know we have to start teaching our children you know children develop at the age of we all develop by just seeing what our parents did there was no child psychology that taught us so it means from our action our children just emulate and they evolve that's the education of the african just do it and they do it okay and there was be nobody oh no i have to go now i have to do this thank you so much Ethiopian world federation incorporation set your alarm thank you brother tell them <laughs> set your alarm when will be when it will be bouncing in Ethiopia, addis ababa on the 23rd to the 25th you know what we're talking about okay you would know so thank you so very much global black family sister kalena me and you are in this trap because you're in the uk we have the same time so it's night but you know what Sonovia, they are loving they're rejoicing we can stay here even to tomorrow it's afternoon hmm. Ashia. bye bye okay we'll go see tomorrow Una, good night salut Una. bye bye so yes tomorrow we see ourselves okay <laughs> bye and bye again and bye good night <laughs> You are watching the Pan-African Daily TV with Dr. Susan Tata. The Africa we want. Unity. Consciousness. Our culture. Our spirituality. Our history. One Africa for Africans worldwide. Motherlands calling its diaspora home. Join my voice. Join my team. Join my campaign. Campaign 21 hashtag 1 million subscribers on the Pan African Daily TV YouTube. Be a volunteer. Apply now. Be the new Africa.